everyone, and welcome to the 11th episode of Slime Time Side Quest, an official Dragon's Den podcast. This is Platy M3. And this is Yangus, the legendary bandit. Uh, before we start, though, I just want to give you folks listening a heads up that this is actually part two of our games in 2020 topic. We started in our last episode. So if you would like to stop this episode and go listen to episode 10 first, uh, then go right ahead. Mm, good point. Um, we'll give the audience a chance to stop this episode here and maybe come back. But if you don't want to, don't worry. Pendy's going to recap a lot of the highlights from the last episode anyway with his games. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, where were we? <laughs> um, we were at the end of a long and crazy year. Very true. But more importantly, we're here to continue talking about our favorite games we played in 2020. A couple of weeks ago, we did an episode with four guests, and they each discussed their favorite games they played in 2020. Their games didn't have to come out in 2020, just something they played this year and enjoyed for the first time. That's right. Austin Navarro told us about his kingly crusades, but he was unfortunately doomed eternally by his internet. That he was, but he's going to be uh, resurrected a little bit later on. We had Brother Jaybird reminding us about the joys of questing and online shenanigans without going too rabid. Brurian took us to the far off future, filled with X after X, but brought us back and taught us how to be like a dragon. And Blue Star shared her tales of houses, uh, three of them in fact, and her star gazing quests. Phew. We learned a lot from everyone last time. We sure did. Audience, give our guests from the last episode a round of applause for being on and talking with us. That's nice. Hey, wait a minute. When did we get the uh, audience to applaud to us? Oh, don't you worry about that, Platy. If there's one thing I've learned in 2020, it's to expect the unexpected. <laughs> Huh, well, fair enough, I guess. Now, putting all that behind us, the format for tonight is the same as we did the last episode. We've got a quartet here to talk about our top three game experiences of the year. The difference being that while we have two new guests, you'll also be hearing Genghis and I share our favorite games of 2020 as well. So let's welcome our new guests for tonight. I mean, we call them new, but they've been on plenty before. Welcome, Evan. Thanks. Hi, how you doing? Good. And welcome, Pendy. Hello. Apparently, I'm Mr. Repeat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, if we got Evan and Pendy on, that means it's our Halloween episode lineup together again. Now then, who will be our first victim for the evening? <laughs> it's me. It'll be me. <laughs> it will be. It will be. <laughs> All right, Evan, tell us your uh, game that you put in third place for favorite experience of the year. Third place on my list, but not third place in my heart, was Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. It's, nice. uh, it's like this weird little hybrid where it's, hey, you just got done playing Pokemon Go, but you haven't played a Pokemon game before? Here you go. It kind of was a mix of uh, Pokemon Go with like a standard game. It's honestly super easy. Um, but the thing that was most unique about the game was uh, you don't uh, battle the Pokemon you run into. You catch them. And all of your battles are just against trainers. And the goal, for the most part, is to just keep catching. Catching, catching, catching Pokemon. You want to catch as many of the same Pokemon as possible. You want to build up a, a big chain of Pokemon. 20, 30, 40, 50. Um, I think my record was almost 200 of one specific Pokemon. And oh my they, goodness! Oh Holy yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think my I think my uh, I took a screenshot. I don't think I hit ten. <laughs> One hundred and fifty. Well, um, because you can chain Chanseys in Cerulean mm -hmm. Cave, and they give you like yeah. ridiculous XP. So you can, and every Pokemon gets about the same XP when you catch a Pokemon. So mm -hmm. like you're getting like six party members getting like seventy thousand XP at a certain point, and you can just oh swap my. them. And you can swap them out like that really quickly while you're in, uh, while you're out and about. You don't have to go to a, a box or Pokemon Center like, and then like that. So you can just swap them right out, and you just keep level, leveling, and leveling, leveling. As long as the chances, any chances, of any of the Pokemon uh, don't run away, you can keep the chain going. Or just so long as you don't uh, battle a different Pokemon, you can even go to different like parts. Like I left Cerulean Cave and ran off to do something else, and then I happened to battle a Chansey somewhere else. 
and my chain kept going. Oh, and nice. that's how, yeah, and it was uh, it was very important to level up your Pokemon because um, the challenge in this game isn't to catch catch them all. Um, you can actually technically catch them all before you even finish uh, battling all the gym leaders uh, because it has uh, connectivity to Pokemon Go, and you can mm -hmm. just trip. And they basically replaced. Um, uh, the Safari Zone with just a spot where you just drop all of your Pokemon from Pokemon Go and you just catch them. And then you filled your Pokedex in like, like 20 minutes. And uh, so the challenge isn't completing your Pokedex, it's uh, battling the master trainers. And it's all after that you beat the Elite Four, all these trainers start popping up all over the, uh, all over the game, all over the map in random areas and they all have one specific pokemon that their master's at and this pokemon can be from level 60 i believe to 70 75 and they are stacked they are roided up you cannot just walk in with say a normal pikachu that you caught and you leveled up to 70 or whatever and expect to win it's going to steamroll you you got to ply it with all these candies because it has candies in this game and you have to Make sure your Pokemon has really high stats, and you have to make sure you give all the correct moves. Uh, usually, if not, you're pretty much done in two turns. Uh, oftentimes, they can go very, they're very fast. So even if you're 20 levels above them, there's still a chance that the other Pokemon will be faster than you and get the first hit and knock you out in one hit. Um, usually, that was another good thing about the Chanseys, though, because they give you health candies, and they start giving you buckets of them. Like, I think I have, like, 999, like, the max of all these health <laughs> candies. And I would just pump all of my Pokemon full of them. So I'd have, like, a Weedle with, like, two, 300 health, some crazy high number. And most of the time, you can get through them with uh, a toxic stall which is where you use toxic and toxic's a move that over time will do more damage so you like more da like more damage each time so if you use toxic then protect then maybe dig and then you know dig takes two turns and then you use protect again by that point just the drain from toxic will knock the pokemon out of course there are some exceptions um you can't use that against most poison pokemon um sometimes they know toxic themselves and they can use it on you uh before you get to hit them uh sometimes uh they have healing abilities so it's a complete waste of time i think there was it was i had one pokemon where i had to i think it was golbat when i was fighting golbat i had to uh uh, pump up my Pokemon's PP so I had more than my rivals or my opponent's Golbat and basically just wear its attack down to zero so I had to use Struggle before I could finally beat it because it kept healing more than I could do damage to it and it's like 151, 153 of them because it includes Melmetal and uh, Melton in here and for the most part uh, there are a couple where like say Articuno, Zapdos, Moltres, um, they will just give them to you. Like you'll, you'll, you can go to the master trainer, show them your level one hundred or whatever Moltres, and they will go, "Oh, hey, I'm gonna name you the master trainer for Moltres." And I believe that's with the three legendary birds: Mewtwo, Mew, and Melton and Melmetal, and Ditto. Because you can't have a Ditto fighting another Ditto. Other than that, you had to, you had to level up 140 plus Pokemon in the <laughs> 70s, 80s, 90s. I had a couple at 100. Um, you'd be surprised the ones that are very easy to beat. I went in with my Charizard thinking it was going to be a struggle. I think I hit them twice and beat them. Maybe I, I think against Dragonite, I hit it once and beat it. Um, but then against Ghastly, I couldn't do it because it was faster than my Ghastly was. And it would hit me with Shadow Ball and knock me out instantly. When I raised my Ghastly's uh, speed and I finally got the first hit in, my Shadow Ball wasn't strong enough to go in one hit. So it was kind of oh. like that. Oh, man, it was a nightmare. I think overall it was about 90 hours of gameplay. But it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was. Um, I like being able to play a game where I can just put on a podcast or like a really long YouTube video and then just listen to that <laughs> while I play the game mm -hmm. muted. It was pretty fun. I, I actually liked it. I can go like two or three hour sessions of level grinding and level grind to like the 70s or 60s or 80s, like multi like seven eight nine ten pokemon in a day at one point i was averaging like 10 12 13 beat master trainers uh, a day i had a big list of every master trainer 
and where to find them. And I just crossed them out each time I did one. And um, uh, it's not that hard because, say, for example, you have Zubat, you know, it's level 97. You beat the Zubat trainer. You just bump it up a level and it becomes Golbat, and you just have to go right to the Golbat trainer. You don't have to level up a Golbat. Oh, you just answered the one question I had. Did you do something like level 98 Caterpie, level yeah. 99 oh, Kakuna, and then whatever stuff like that? Don't get me started on Metapod and Kakuna, because, <laughs> because you could only use Tackle and Harden. And oh, yeah. Geez. And so I think there was this weird thing where I used an item to bump up my uh metapod and kakuna is a tackle uh up to its highest uh, the pp of their moves the highest it can go because otherwise i was going to run out of attack before i could finish off the other metapod and Caterpie because they keep uh raising their uh defense so drastically so it was like this really weird war of attrition it took me like 10 15 minutes each fight oh geez that was geez. It was it was pretty brutal <laughs> You know, it sounds like that, um, maybe you'll remember this from the anime, Evan, but I remember, like, way back when the Pokemon anime started off, Oh yeah. there was a point where Ash had the Metapod, and he comes across another kid with a Metapod, and literally the battle between the two of them was just them standing, facing each other, not doing anything. <laughs> I thought just cl- imagine what, how those battles played out for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was... It was pretty brutal, but luckily, like, I was able to pace myself. I'd be like, okay, let's go do, uh, I don't know, let's go do Raichu right now. Okay, now let's just go do, uh, you know, uh, Pikachu, whatever, uh, Dugong. I would just bounce around. I'd save some of the harder. I'd always try to do, all right, let's do Metapod today, and that'll be, like, the big one I did today. And then tomorrow I'll do another, like, complex one, like Golbat. Or whatever, and I would just do that. There was also some really scumbag tactics you could do. Like, there were still the one-hit KO moves. So, so long as your Doug Trio was faster than your opponents, you could one-hit KO them with, like, a Fisher. Fisher. So, yeah, there was, a, a, there was multiple Pokemon where you can one-hit KO. So, I got to, like, you know, squeak by on a couple of those. Jeez. Oh, yeah, it was fun. But, yeah, it's, like, despite all that, the game is for, like, beginners. It's, like, pathetically easy. I don't think I lost once to a single trainer. Um, They introduce, like, a really lame uh, rival who sort of replaces uh, the rival from the original game, but the rival's still in there. He uses his as like his own character and the rival is like pathetically easy. I think it was, it was, uh, it's, it's for, it's for, it's like one of those easy to learn, tough to master kind of games. Yeah. My son and I played this. We did let's go, uh, Pikachu. I want to say in like June or July, because you can play this two player couch co-op. Oh yeah. And, what makes it even easier is every battle then becomes two on one. It was always yeah. my son and me oh. both being a two on one. Um, so, so I mean, yeah, we never own Pokemon then is what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When the turn came up, um, if you were catching Pokemon, you both were throwing Pokeballs from the same um, bag of balls. I was always yelling at my son. I'm like, stop throwing so fast. <laughs> he's just like, he's just sitting there going. I'm like, oh my God, you just went through 10 great balls in about three seconds. What are you doing? Like, oh, that was stop. another thing. Like, getting, getting great balls, getting Pokeballs was a, was a struggle. You had to do all yes. this. Crazy, you had to do all this crazy. Um, I believe you could rebattle the, the gym leaders again once a day. So like, you know, you can go to we Brock. Did that. Yep. You get like 10,000, you know, gold, whatever it is, monies. And you just, oh my god, that was the worst part, honestly. The worst part wasn't all the level grinding. It was rebattling the same gym leaders again and again and again to get money for Pokeballs. Yep, towards the end, we, we did that. I remember that distinctly, like, my son was again, like, why do we have to keep doing this? I'm like, because we need money. <laughs> We're poor. <laughs> We're pokey poor. <laughs> Gotta do the grind. <laughs> Gotta do the grind. And what's great is um, I this got my son finally into what it means to play a Pokemon game. Um, he sat down for about 10 hours when we finally beat this, and we didn't do any of those master challenges. We were on to other stuff. We were, then we did Marvel <laughs> Ultimate Alliance after that. But once he finally knew and understand what the battles were like, I kind of put him on the 3DS with Ultra Moon, kind of set him free, and he played that for, gosh, a good 10 hours over the course of a week, really enjoyed it until one day he was sitting on the floor cross-legged 
and kind of bumped the power button on the 3DS with his knee or something. And he lost like two hours of progress. Uh, and that was it. Oh, no. He did not want to do it again. Now, fast forward till November, December, and I finally got us Pokemon Sword and Shield. And he's like 60 hours into that game now. I bought him the all-in-one cart with the uh, DLC on it. And he's just, he's having a ball. And even un- unprompted for me... He said something. He's like, I want to go catch every single one of the ones on the Island of Armor, Daddy. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get every single one on the Island of Armor. And I'm like, "Eh, good luck. (laughs) Oh, man, that's the fear of of every RPG player is to get hours into an RPG and then to excellent get reset somehow and lose all that progress. Yeah. I'm sure we've all gone through that at one point. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Happened to the Pokemon game, too, actually. (laughs) Yeah, I told him as he was sitting there crying. I said, listen, dude, this has happened to me so many times over the years. Mm. And it just was enough that he was like, nope, I don't want to play that again for a while. I and don't then, blame him. I've been there. Yep, after, after a while, he was just too busy playing other games. And yes. I think we got uh, we might have got Super Mario Galaxy at that point, too. Or not Galaxy, but the uh, the newest one. Yeah, Is the All-Stars Galaxy? Collection. Galaxy uh, Party, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so... You should see. You should have told your son. It was like, um, like my experience with RPGs when I first played it. I didn't know you had to save all the time, so I just figured it was a race to see how fast you could beat the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only, my only regret with this game, the Let's Go, is we sold it before um, I realized I could get the free Pokemon Home and trade all of our good ones to the home. Yes. So the save date is still on the Switch, but we have our six best Pokemon in our party. And there's no way to move him out of the party. I need to, like, find some kid at school and be like, hey, man, can I borrow your Let's Go Pikachu for a night? I just need it for one night. Five minutes, load it up, transfer the Pokemon into the boxes, and be done. Because, yeah, he's asked before, because I traded, uh, we traded some of our other ones that were in boxes in the home and then from home to Sword and Shield. So, oops, got rid of that, I guess, a couple months too early. All right. But for the sake of the show, we're going to move away from uh, Pokemon, unless Pendy has played it too. <laughs> no, I'm not into Pokemon, so the only thing that's running through my head right now is uh, Britney Spears Toxic, because I kept mentioning so. <laughs> da, 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 da. That's all. I, that's all. That's just my mind right now. <laughs> wow. And on that note, we're going to move into Pendy's uh, game number three of the year, which uh, I don't think really has anything to do with Britney Spears, though. <laughs> Yep, so my first game is going to be the mobile game Dragon Quest of the Stars for iOS and Android. Google tells me that it started in Japan, 15 October 2015, (laughs) and the global version that we now all can play in English and other various languages started 25 Feb 2020. I have played this every single day since it came out. (laughs) Wow. It's 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 been a lot of fun, honestly. Um, I... I have three, you get three characters. I have them all maxed out on my first three main jobs that I did Battlemaster, Superstar, and Sage. Battlemaster Battle Master being your offensive powerhouse, Superstar kind of support and healing. Sage, as you guys know, you know, kind of mix of offensive and defensive magic. Um, they've all been revocated three times to level 99, and I'm working on three new jobs now Pirate, Paladin, and Armamentalist. I've had fun doing the main story, special events and the DQ-themed special events, specifically when they go after a certain game. So, like, for example, right now, we recently wrapped up Part 1 of Dragon Quest Seven, and Part 2 should be on the way here in the, the near future. Uh, the DQ-7 event was uh, refreshingly unique, too. You actually have to collect tablet pieces, just like you do in the game, uh, from various missions to open up new ones. It's interesting how they put it together. Mm-hmm. So... As you know, as uh, it's a gotcha game, so you can spend money on the game, but you really don't have to, which is what's nice about this one. I've seen YouTube guides of people taking on the hardest bosses in this game with nothing but the evolved event gear you can get for free for doing the various special events. Uh, when it comes to multiplayer functions, some gotcha games like to focus like on player versus player, but DQ OTS, however, focuses in on cooperative missions. It's actually a, a great way to get through most of the harder bosses. With the exception of the story mode, pretty much all the events have that multiplayer option to take them on with other people. It's something I like, I like about this game a lot, to kind of cooperate with a bunch of random people or people you know and take on all these hard bosses. And if you like this game and you need help, I highly recommend joining the Dragon Quest of the Stars global Facebook group. Uh, there's the official page that it has, but there's also a fan group too. Uh, it's a very helpful group. I don't use it too much. I use the, 
the fan group a lot, but there's also a Facebook chat that I joined uh, that I found through the Facebook group where people will get together and do missions all the time. Unfortunately, my phone is crap <laughs> and crashes the game too often, so I haven't participated that much, but I have a few times. Great bunch of guys and girls. Um, they have people out there that will help you taking down fiend-level bosses and things like that. A lot of helpful people. Um, on that note, it really is time to upgrade my phone. I'm just chugging along with an old iPhone 6. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> Uh, so that's why it, it doesn't play that great. I have like, you know, uh, there's settings in the game where you can like uh, downgrade the graphics and mm -hmm. take care of, take out all the effects. I have it like as far down as it can go and it, it barely, <laughs> barely does it. <laughs> uh, my, fia my, my fiance happens to be in the mobile gaming too. She, she actually has two phones. One is just for gaming. She has a gaming phone and one for everything else. I might might end up doing the same thing, uh, especially with uh, games like Tactics coming out on the horizon. Uh, they mm. recently wrapped up a great Christmas event. One of the features was on the world map where they had a little Santa and reindeer flying around, and they would, he would give you a premium gift like every three hours, so that was cool. Uh, they also had very cool Christmas-themed monsters and gear. In fact, what I'll do now is I'm going to drop pictures of my crew and yeah, of my current crew into the chat here. Where did I put that? Ooh, I got to see this last week. You did. You did. Yes. So I'm going to show you my was over characters. my house for a uh, classic NES beatdown of me. <laughs> <laughs> if you've listened to the other side quests, um, was it you or me that brought up you? You brought up uh, Tecmo Super Bowl when we talked about the NES games, right? Yes. No, that was you. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Sorry. It was one of us, and then we yeah, talked about it. Somebody. And then... That was a while ago when we did that one. <laughs> yeah, and well, Pendy brought his uh, original NES over and kicked my butt quite a bit. I won once when his team was like depleted of four players. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because I was in the middle of a season, which I never reset. So I think it was the 49ers-Bills game. You picked the 49ers, which is the best team in the game, and I picked the Bills. Oh, yeah. and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do well with the Bills. But then I didn't realize that, oh, hey, the quarterback is injured. Well, this isn't gonna, not going to go well at all. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. But you guys should be able to see the pictures in the chat now. Um, where was I here? Looking on my notes, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, you'll see the, the main guy, which is I named after myself, is the Pendy guy. So he's a guy with a fancy winter coat, and he's got, like, the King Slime cake hat that I won in the casino. Oh, which, cool. which also reminds me, they recently upgraded the casino again. Now when you get coin bags and treasure chests, you can also get upgrades instead of coins. So you can get columns that block the side pits where the coins can fall down. Uh, you can get the ability to shoot coins faster and extensions so that the pushing platform goes out even further as it pushes the coins towards you and all the different things you can win. So you may also notice that I'm sporting Cloud's Buster Sword. I was that's, just about to ask. Yeah, I was just about to ask. So that's they did a final. They recently did a Final Fantasy crossover event with one of the other Final Fantasy mobile games. I forget which one. There's like four of them or something like that. But they did a cross crossover with one of them, and that's how I was able to get that. I got some other Final Fantasy gear and stamps <laughs> and stuff like that too. It was it was cool. Uh, the second one is named after my fiance Kiami. She's the one, the girl that's in Christmas gear, the red glasses. She actually wears red glasses. And then the last is named after my cat, Chester. He's the snowboarder dude. Uh, notice the, the snowboard that he has. It's got all the little slimes on it. It's like a slime design snowboard. So I thought that was pretty cool. It's actually a boomerang weapon, which is my guy's main weapon. So it kind of works out perfectly because like it's, it has that thing like with Dragon Quest XI S where you can uh, equip certain armor and keep the look of something, but then actually use something oh, yeah. else. So it's got mm -hmm. that kind of dynamic to it. So I'm hoping this game sticks around. I want to at least play through all the main game events for like 8 and 9 and 10, 11. And I want to see these super advanced classes that the Japanese game has right now that we haven't gotten yet. And with the Adventures of Die anime getting some attention here, I hope that they also do that Die event that I know they did back in the Japanese version as well. Uh, any of you guys still play this at all? Or do you guys kind of give up after the after the kind of first couple of rounds of it? So, no, Matt, you, you played it. Or, Platty, you played it early on. but I did. But that's not, not really your kind of kind of your game. No, I, I, I was gone within about a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was playing for about a week. But trying to memorize all these maps and all these little buttons here and there and all these systems and all these mobile games is a little bit of a... A little bit of a chore. I swear I, the mobile games have more systems to them than a mainline game at this point. <laughs> yeah, I played this one for 
uh, about a month or two, I think, when it came out this year. But after a while, I only would log in to do like the free chess polls and eventually, you know, just see what sort of events were going on. But I just I just lost interest in it. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. It's not. It's definitely gotcha games are not for everybody. It's a different. This would be a good time to uh, plug the unofficial official. (laughs) The official, unofficial Dren, da- Dragon's Den Discord. Because um, Burian made that what, four or five months again ago, and the kind of original purpose was, was to get people together that play Dragon Quest of the Stars. So oh. I know that is the most uh, talked about area in our Discord. So we always have the link in all of our newer podcasts of that. So if you're not a Facebook person or if you're... <clears throat> not want to get on the Facebook group um, that they're on there every day posting, Hey, we're running this, we're running that blue stars, big onto that. Uh, this is one of her top three games of the year. And I think pretty much most of the people through the den discord, they still play quite a bit. I'll have to check that out. Cause I've just not tried discord yet. So maybe I'll have to uh, break the, break my virginity, my discord virginity on that one. <laughs> check it out. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the pop. moment where I hit the mature button on the podcast. <laughs> pop that cherry. <laughs> pop it. Uh, pop that cherry. E for explicit. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Well, if uh, we're we're done there, I'm going to move into my number three game because uh, Platy comes before Yankus alphabetically. That's the excuse I'm going to give. <laughs> um, <laughs> And gosh, I can't even like find where I typed in the podcast. So yeah, this will be great. Oh, um, I do want to kind of give an honorable already mentioned because I already mentioned a lot of these games uh, this year. I kind of weeded out ones that I have either talked about on Slime Time or Slime Time Side Quest. Dragon Quest X was a great deal of fun, but I recorded two episodes on that. Graveyard Keeper, we were all four together when I talked about that at Halloween. Nino Kuni 2 was in our Nino Kuni episode. Nexomon Extinction was in our Not Pokemon episode. And uh, one other game will get talked about later here by Evan, so I'll uh, mention that too. So my number three gaming experience of the year was Rune Factory 4 Special. And Rune Factory 4, if you don't know what Rune Factories are, um, they basically took the Harvest Moon idea of a farm sim and then mixed it with an action RPG. So you're farming to get food that you can then cook and trade with the farms people, find a wife, um, all the good Harvest Moon kind of stuff, Stardew Valley kind of stuff, but there's battles. Now, Stardew Valley has a couple of battles in, it, like, one cave. I think they've... Well, they had a second cave um, and may have added a third by now. There's, I mean, this game's been going for years. But uh, Rune Factory games always have tons of dungeons. I mean, that's you, to advance the story, you have to be doing the battling. Um, you're interacting, there's always a blacksmith in town, there's always somebody will sell you the armor, um, you, a big part of it is crafting, you're not only getting food to make, um, growing food to sell, but then you're growing food to turn into dishes that are, um, charging up your health or your SP powers when you're out battling in the dungeons, um, you can raise animals in them. Uh, this game, you can take two animals or two townspeople with you um, anytime you walk out of the town. And the people actually, the and I mean, I guess you could call them NPCs because you're not really controlling them directly, but you can take armor up to one of the NPCs and just throw it at the person and then they put it on. And it's funny. Um, and then you take them out to battle and yeah, you throw weapons at them and they'll equip the weapon and you take them out with you and they level up. They get the experience. They do stuff too. Um, so this is the second time I played this game. I played it four or five, gosh, it may have been six years ago when it came out on 3DS. Um, wait a minute. You replayed a game? What? (gasps) I, I know I never replay games, but I, for this, I've always said, I've got three series that are my favorites, Dragon Quest, Grandia, and Rune Factory. And my God, I actually replayed Grandia one and two in the past year. And I replayed Rune Factory four. So when they come oh, out on goodness. new systems, I, I can be talked into doing this. I'm shocked, sir. Dragon Quest shocked. games, I've a, uh, I know, I know. <laughs> Ladies and so, gentlemen, uh, this is a groundbreaking moment in in uh, the history of Slime Time. <laughs> Platy has admitted he replays games. <laughs> so what I thought was cool about this is this came out for the Switch, obviously, and they took a two screen game and made it one. And honestly, 
I don't think they had any problems. They mapped because uh, the second screen's usually maps, and they keyed that to pressing like the ZR button or hitting the plus button to pull up extra information at times, and I, it was fine. I mean, I played ninety nine percent of the time in handheld mode, and I had no problem having a little corner of my screen be the map. I didn't need a entire screen to be filled with a map so i think it was fine it was a great test because uh they're making rune factory 5 now and that should be out in japan in 2021 um we'll see if we get lucky enough to get it then my guess is it's an early 2022 game but you know th this is something that you can easily play for 100 hours the game is divided into three big story arcs um I can't remember if you get credits after the first arc. You definitely get credits, and it's kind of like game over after the second story arc. And something that I can only report on that I didn't have a problem with in the first game, but apparently it was like the biggest flaw of the second game is, to start the third story arc, you've kind of like almost already saved the kingdom at the end of the second story arc. The first arc has to do with this dragon that's in town, and you deal with that, and it's like kind of like, the end of its story is right there. But then it's like, oh man, this army is going to invade. Let's stop the bad empire. And that's the whole second story arc. And when you do that, you get credits. It's like, woohoo, yay. Um, but sad things kind of happen that you can reverse the course of events. You know, little spoilers from uh, Dragon Quest Eleven. It's almost like that, where you've got, it's broken into three parts. And if you stopped at the end of the second part, you'd have a lovely, complete game. But if you want to get more out of it, play that third arc. Well, in the 3DS version of the game, or in both versions, getting that third story arc to uh, trigger was pretty much like any of all these other little um, side quest, side content that come out. Some days you just wake up in a town, you're going to talk to a townsperson, and they're like, oh my god, have you seen this? Have you seen that? And suddenly you're stuck for like three days completing this little side quest thing. Well... And they're all pretty much random when they happen. Well, unfortunately, they locked the third part of the story into a random event. So there were people that would play on the 3DS, like play an entire game year, 120 days, and it wouldn't start the post-game whole story arc. I never had that problem. For me, it launched like right away. So it was funny years later hearing all these people complain about Rune Factory 4 and like, oh God, I hope they fix this. I'm like, what do you mean? I went straight into the third story arc and beat that, you know? That's why I spent 100 hours on the game. Um, but uh, from all the reports that I've known, I did the review of this game for rpgamer.com and I had it launch for me within two days. Um, and I had my editor like, hey, can you save there right at the beginning and see if you can have it launch? I think I did it three or four times. And every single time the post game story arc started within a couple days. So they, and everybody else that I've known that's playing it, which is not that many people, um, nobody's reported that being a problem. So they must have tweaked that to uh, pretty much happen right after you beat the main game. But I just love these games. These games are chill. Um, I, I got away from Harvest Moon like 15 years ago ago just because it was like i get it i farm and i get married to the end um but the combat in these games is pretty much uh it's what uh, uh fantasy life was very simple you know kind of zelda ish <laughs> more like zelda one ish combat the original nes one i mean it's th it came out on the 3ds and now it's on the switch so it's a little bit bigger than that but it's very simplistic combat i mean i'm no action rpg fan this is not a souls game by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and there's so many ways to just cheese things in this game. You can recruit monsters. So in the third story arc, when things were getting pretty hard, instead of uh, power leveling, I just went into this optional dungeon and just started throwing gifts at like level 200 monsters that could take me out in like two hits. And it didn't take but five minutes before I recruited one. And then that I got a second one and it was just, okay, let me go back to the dungeon I may be like a level 110, but I've got two level 200 monsters with me. And we just kind of wipe the floor with the uh, post-game dungeon, pretty much. So if you like Stardew Valley, I, I think these games are, they're 3D versions of that. Stardew Valley kind of simplified the graphics and just really made the gameplay very concise. Rune Factory is a deeper game with a lot more content. It's not for everyone because it's uh, definitely very JRPG tropey compared to something like Stardew Valley. Um, what's funny is I actually remember when I was applying to be a um, writer at RP Gamer, 
they had you write a couple stories or like, hey, write an editorial. Hey, write like a news story. Hey, write something like this and submit it. And I wrote an editorial about five ways that Rune Factory could become as popular as Stardew Valley, you know stop being so brightly chippified JRPG. I know I like that, but that's not the main draw. You know, look at Stardew Valley with its six, seven, eight million dollars worth of sales. Um, and then I looked up like Rune Factory and they were so excited that Rune Factory 4, I want to say it was the best one on the 3DS and it was like 200, 250,000 sales outside of Japan and not that much more in Japan. So these are not uh, top sale games, but I, it, it's it, it's Stardew Valley as a JRPG, basically. You got all the townsfolk, different marriage options, and the combat, though, is definitely 50-50 a part of it. it you're playing an ARPG 50% of the time and doing farming the other 50% of the time. Anybody ever play a Rune Factory game? I did play the one on the Wii, uh, Frontier. Uh, I oh, got, yeah. I got exactly on the dot 10 hours into it. And <laughs> uh, the, uh, definitely the kind of game I would feel would work better uh, on handheld than on a console. It's really not the kind of game where I want to be sitting on my couch, holding a controller, staring at my massive TV. I'd rather just be chilling, relaxing in bed, holding a little Switch, 3DS, whatever. And plop it down when I'm done, and pick it back up when I want to play it again. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's the only game in the series I haven't ever even touched. Um, there was four of them on DS, 3DS, Rune Factory 1, 2, 3, 4. Then they had that one for the Wii, and then they had Tides of Destiny, which came out, I want to say for the Wii or the Wii U. It was um, for the Wii but, and the PS3. P PS3, yeah. I was just mentioning that to um, Trippy Star Slime the other day because congratulations to him he's about to have a little baby yeah. anytime in the next week their uh, bags are packed for the hospital but i mentioned to him that i was actually renting that game on ps now via the playstation 4 and i don't know what possessed me to do the 90 day rental back when that was a thing i rented it for 90 days to stream on the ps4 and i think i did that about 25 days before my son was born i don't think i even turned it on after day 25 but uh, sitting with my newborn, rocking him to sleep and rocking him back to sleep at two and three in the morning, I definitely played through Bravely Default 1 and Bravely Second <laughs> all the way in about uh, four or five months. So I told him, I said, get get used to turning your PS4 off and have more time with your Switch in the uh, next few months. <laughs> but all right, Yangus, time to round up the uh, our third choices with yours. Okay. Well, I think before I do that, I'll just quickly mention my honorable mentions. Um, so had I really had a lot of trouble deciding what my number three game was going to be, but I finally just decided from all my honorable mentions just to pick one that I played the most. But for my honorable mentions, um, there was Clubhouse Games, which came out in uh, the summer of this year. It's one that I have been able to play with my friends and family a little bit at gatherings, you know, with what you can do with the COVID stuff going on. Um, but I had, I've had a good time with that one. Uh, there was Luigi's Mansion 3, which was originally going to be my number three. But since we talked about that one a lot in the Halloween episode, I decided to skip using that one for tonight's episode. Right. Uh, there's Pikmin 3 Deluxe, which I recently just got for Christmas, but I've been having a ton of fun with. And it's been really nice playing a Pikmin game again. Uh, there was Heavy Burger, which is a.k.a. the best $2 I've spent on the eShop because it's such a crazy idea for an arcade game. Um, there was uh, Super Mario 3D All-Stars, which, again, if you want to hear my thoughts and opinions on those games in the collection, you can go back to our uh, Super Mario 3D game episode. Uh, there was Monster Hunter Generations, the Sega Genesis collection for the Switch. Uh, for IndieWise, there was a short hike in Jenny LeClue, which released this year on the Switch. And just to be funny, um, Smash Brothers Ultimate again, because apparently that's my most played game on my Switch two years in a row. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Getting away from the honorable mentions, though, my number three pick for this year would be Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. Uh, the game originally released on the Wii back in 2010 and was part of Operation Rainfall, which, uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, basically there were three big RPGs that were coming out for the Nintendo Wii in Japan only. Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles, The Last Story, and Pandora's Tower. People, you know, really wanted to see these games released outside of Japan, so they started Facebook groups. I think Twitter was just starting out at that point, so there was, like, Twitter discussions going on, and eventually Eventually, you know, Nintendo did release uh, Xenoblade Chronicles over here in the West as GameStop exclusive. And then XSeed came in and uh, helped publish The Last Story and Pandora's Tower. Uh, anyway, 
with Xenoblade Chronicles, uh, this was a game that was one of the first big projects after Monolith Soft became a part of Nintendo. And if you recognize the name Xeno in the title, you might have played something like Xeno Gears or Xeno Saga from PlayStation systems or from other systems in the past. Uh, yeah. But Xenoblade Chronicles is a game that takes place on the bodies of two dead giants. Uh, one is the Mechonis and one is the Bionis. Basically, the game stories, the game's backstory is that the two giants fought each other to the death, and when they both landed a killing blow, um, they both just stood still in this endless ocean, and from that, life began to spring up from them, which is then where it leads into the events of the game and how there's now essentially the battle is continuing between the different races that have sprung up from the life and energy of these two giants. Um, so this story focuses on uh, main character Shulk, who eventually is able to wield the sacred sword called the Monado, which is believed to be the sword of the Bionis, which is where he and all of the main characters that you play as come from. Uh, the, the Monado is supposedly the sword that the Bionis used back in its battle, but now in a more smaller compact form, and whoever's able to properly wield it will be able to help uh, you know, free the Bionis from uh, the Mechonis and its control, and from the Mechons, which come from the Mechonis. And as you go through the game, you have different characters that join you, like there's Shulk's best friend, Ryan, there's his uh, childhood friend and love interest, uh, Meli- or, sorry, not Melia. <laughs> Um, uh, Fiora, excuse me, that's her name. Uh, there's the hero of the Homs, which is basically like the human race of this game, uh, named Dunban, who originally was able to wield the Monado, but not as effectively as Shulk can now. Uh, there was Sharla, who is a medic from one of the other colonies on the Bionis, and she's, she is a good support character, more of a supporter medic type character rather than frontline, but uh, she still travels with the party. Uh, there's Melia, who is called a High Entio, which is essentially a race that lives near the top of the Bionis and kind of live in their own little secluded um, sanctuary slash society. And then you have Ricky, who is a little uh, Nopon, which is a race that travels all across the Bionis. And they're essentially like traders and merchants and things like that. And he is what's called the Hero Pawn and is the, and is the chosen hero of the Nopon. But from what the story tells you, he's pretty much just kind of thrust into that role because he owes the village a large debt and they figure that's the only way he can repay his debt to his village. <laughs> is by acting as a hero. So these characters join you as you progress through the game. And as the story plays out, there were a lot of moments that really, like, made me go, oh, wow. Like, I was not expecting that. Or that was, you know, it's the delivery for a lot of the story cut scenes that can kind of get you like, oh, crap. Or like, oh, wow, that was really cool. Uh, I did originally play this game uh, via the Wii version, but it was one that I wasn't able to get very far into. I didn't really pay attention to a lot of the tutorials and how to like properly use the combat system and things like that. So I eventually got stuck on a dual boss that's in the High Intia Tombs, that's in the head of the Bionis area, or also the Aerith Sea area. Basically, it's a boss that, when I got to it in the Wii one, I think I was not only severely underleveled, but I was also not very good at like using the combat to its like fullest potential, since I really hadn't been messing with side quests or like messing with my equipment all that much. So I think I just completely got steamrolled, and I just eventually was like, I'm just gonna set this game off to the side, and I never once back once never once went back to it. Luckily, Ooh, though, you didn't do the side game. quests. I know. <laughs> That's what I heard this whole game's about. <laughs> it pretty much is, and I'll I'll get to that. But <laughs> I pretty much did not mess with the side quest all that much when I originally played it. But what kind of side the... quest host are you? You're not doing side <laughs> quests. Hey, that was that was ten years ago, Yangus. He was a dumbass. So <laughs> leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but. Uh, with getting the uh, definitive edition, I saw it was coming out, and I'm like, oh, you know, that's really cool that you know they're bringing it to the Switch, which you know made total sense because Xenoblade Chronicles 2 came out a few years ago on the system, and I got surprised with it for my birthday, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. So I, you know, really got into that then because I had a few days off from work because you saw my uh, vacation time, and I really found myself enjoying the game a lot more now than when I originally tried to play it, or when I originally tried to play it, because for one, I was taking my time more and exploring the world and the environments, you know doing more of the side quest stuff. And really, I just felt like the game clicked with me a lot more uh, playing it on my Switch than it did on my Wii. And it is nice, too, with the Switch version that, you know, you can either play it on the TV and really appreciate, like, all the new details and, up like, updated graphics and everything, because they definitely 
like completely overhauled the look of the game to make it look a little similar like the graphic style they used for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. But what I really enjoyed about this game and what I really enjoy about uh, RPGs in general is when you get to explore these big areas and, you know, see what you can find and fill out your map more and more as you play through it. And I really enjoyed how this world was built because, like I said, it takes place across these two titans and two giants that are just so huge. You go into these areas... There are some really cool areas that you get to go through. Like one of them that probably if you played Smash Brothers, you know about this one is the Gower Plains, which is this huge open landscape that's, I believe it's along the legs of the Bionis and like it's lower. Uh, no, it's like it's legs and it's waist, I believe. It's this huge sprawling area. You can get to one end of it. You can still see the beginning of it from the cliffs that you start climbing up. And as you go through the game, you'll start to realize that you can see other landmarks from the other areas like you get to the forest area where the no pond are from and if you look up into the sky you can sort of see where uh the head of the bionis slash the Aerith sea area is going to eventually come into play and you get up there you can then eventually see like the makanis a little better you can see what like a future area is going to look like so it's cool that you can see landmarks and details from these other areas of the game as you progress um with this definitive edition they did add a few changes in uh, most notably, they added in what's called expert mode, which basically allows you to customize the difficulty uh, to your liking, which I thought was an awesome addition. Because like when I got to that boss that really just had me stuck, I pretty much just dumped all of my extra experience points into my characters and I just steamrolled that boss. Because I'm like, I'm not getting stuck on you again. <laughs> but then once I got past Learned the your boss, lesson. Yep, I did. <laughs> and then once I got past the boss, I just lowered my levels down a little bit. So the nice thing is you can sort of uh, tailor fit the game to what difficulty you're looking for. Like if you want to have it so uh, enemies and bosses are, or sorry, that if your character's on a little more on the level with enemies and bosses where you're at, you know, and you want to try and make it a little more challenging for yourself or make it more even footing, you know, you can do that. If you want to keep yourself really overpowered, you can you know, dump all of your st- uh, dump all of your experience points into your characters so they're you know super strong. Or if you're like me, you might um, do a little bit of both, where you'll have some of your characters at like sort of the expected level, but then you'll have a character like Sharla in who can uh, really heal you for a lot of damage if things start to go really bad, or she can do one of her regular attacks and you know help take off a bit more chunk of the enemy's HP. But she she's not necessarily going to be like you know the like the one that's going to deal all the killing blows or do the most damage. So you get a nice little balance depending on what you're looking for. Um, but with this game, like I said, I originally just did not get into the side quests and everything when I played it on the Wii. Uh, with the side quest in the Switch version, I believe it's all still relatively the same. There is a new like time attack mode that you can tackle for side quests to get some extra costumes and things like that. But that luckily those are just a completely optional thing. But with the side quests, I was really enjoying my time with the game, but I think I end, I burnt myself out a bit by doing so many of them because this game has so many goddamn side quests. It has so many. <laughs> I feel like you, you feel like you finish one and then five more open up. It's crazy. But I think that's... I think that's sort of the style of it with being it's sort of a offline. Oh, it's it's almost reminds me of like an offline MMO or something, just with how combat is and things like that. Were you going to say something, Pendy? I was going to say if uh, it should be right up your alley, side quest. <laughs> I, I like side quests, side quests, but only to like a certain degree. Like <laughs> you got to have a meaningful side quest when it's just all the same. Yeah, this is episode kill. eleven, not five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, so are these um, related to Xenosaga or Xenogears at all? Because I played all of those, but I haven't played Xenoblade because I'm not. I usually don't play too many action RPGs. You know, it- I'm. I'll be honest with you, Pendy. I really don't know if there's a huge connection to them. Only thing I know is that in Xenoblade Chronicles Two, they did add uh, Cosmos from the Xenosaga games oh. as like a recruitable character you can potentially get mm-hmm. from one of the mechanics of that game, but. As far as like other connections, I really, I, I don't know. I'm afraid. Oh, that might be interesting to to find out then, because like if, because but because sometimes when Cosmos shows, because she shows up in a bunch of games, because everybody loves her so much. But usually when she shows up in another game, she's like, oh, I, I've I've uh, come from another dimension or something like that. I wonder if that's the case in that game or is actually kind of connected to the world somehow. But like Zen, Xenogears Zen Saga, I don't think is. Um, aren't really connected uh, at all. It's just like kind of the same kind of Xeno theme of, of mm-hmm. mechs and, and stuff like that. But I don't know. 
Cool. Yeah, and there, there very well could be references to like to those other games that I just you know having not played them myself that I just mm. didn't catch. But I do yeah. have uh, Xeno Gears on my Vita. I just haven't played it yet. But um, anyway, uh, with just to wrap up my thoughts on Xenoblade Chronicles, like I unfortunately did get a little burnt out a while ago on doing so many side quests, so I put the game aside to try and focus on some other stuff. But I do want to go back to the game, especially since I believe you said you got it for Christmas, didn't you, Evan? Did you say you I just did. recently got it? Yep, that's my, one of my goals for 2021, to finish that game. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I might be alongside with you there, because honestly, yeah. you talking about the game on the den was like, you know, I really should go back and finish it, because I really, like, even though I have put the Switch version aside, I really was enjoying myself a lot with it. I was really getting into the story and the characters, the combat I was having a ton of fun with compared to when I originally played it. It's one of those games, I think, where it does help if you sort of take your time and get used to things and it's a really big game too so that's pretty easy to do but i'd like to go back to the game maybe do a sec like make a second save file off my current data um just so that way i can have one where i just you know can go through focus on the story stuff and then i can use the other one to you know go back and take my time a bit more do more of the side quests and things like that try and get a little more out of the experience and then with this uh definitive edition they actually did add in a new epilogue which i haven't looked up what exactly mm. happens in it but i believe it takes place a little while after uh the end of this game xenoblade chronicles and it stars uh shulk and melia and i think some of ricky's kids or his family or something like that but i think it's supposed to be a bit of a connection to xenoblade chronicles 2 as well so you know when i eventually get done with the game i'd like to check that out and if you are looking for a good switch rpg i would recommend xenoblade chronicles definitive edition it's definitely a long game but it's one that you can have a lot of fun with and if you just enjoy kind of an rpg that you know kind of takes its time building up its world and just showing like a nice progression of character development and camaraderie between the characters and stuff. I think you'll enjoy uh, Xenoblade Chronicles quite a bit. And really with the Switch version, I mean, hey, you can play it at home or play it on the go. So got the best of both worlds that way. <laughs> yeah, I played um, Xenoblade Chronicles X on the Wii U. I was really hyped for it when it was coming out. I was like so excited. And then I started playing it and I was like, you know what? I'm in college right now. I've got enough classes on my plate. I don't need to take another class in how to play Xenoblade Chronicles X. <laughs> <laughs> there was so many systems, so many menus, so many screens, uh, so much you could do, and I was, my brain was melting trying to play that game. And that was before I even got the mechs. The mechs, the big selling point of that game, which is like 20 hours into the game. I probably put in about 10 or so, uh, 10, 12 hours, didn't get to the mechs. I was like, my brain is fried trying to figure this game out. <laughs> and I, it, it was a lot in that game. It was huge huge so i was like oh i'm gonna put this down and it was like one of those games where well once you put it down you probably just put it down for the rest of your life because of how much you have to do i have to like take a month out of my time like no other hobbies but to play this specific game <laughs> just to be, just to be in that state of mind <laughs> oh man well evan keep on going we'll uh take it maybe not All a right. month but uh take some time and do your number two <laughs> nice transition uh oh <laughs> wasn't that good Go we'll take so a I, number two. Uh, <laughs> Let's so hear I came in here with an agenda. Uh, by the oh, end God. of this conversation, I want to convince Yangus to play my number two pick, Tokyo Mora Sessions, Sharp FB. Woohoo! <laughs> it's a really good game. It's People call it like Persona or SMT Lite, and I think that's like a fair comparison. It's like half the length, um, and story isn't as serious uh there's no time management like in persona um you just you just decide when you want to go into dungeons you don't have to do any social links all that fun stuff um but in a way i thought that was kind of one of its best features uh not having to worry about having to manage all of your time not having to constantly leave the dungeon to go to bed wake up the next day go back to the dungeon again all that stuff it was nice to just leave save go back in uh you can heal your party up um, after you leave the dungeons, go back in. Uh, it's got, it's actually a little bit better, the dungeons at least, than Persona 4, uh, because Persona 4 was just like, just straightforward, go to these doors or stairs or whatever, go to the next floor, find the next set of stairs, go to the next floor. Um, whereas these are like full-fledged dungeons where you have to solve puzzles and uh, figure, figure your way around the dungeon. Uh, Platy will probably agree with me. Uh, that 
dungeon with the dresses wasn't the best dungeon to do. Oh my god. I hated that dungeon. And, and then you had to and, keep going back to it. Yeah, you had to do it twice later. Oh. <laughs> and it was I like, come on, if there's there any like dungeon I don't want to do three times, it was that. It was, there was a, the final boss dungeon, there was a part in the middle where I was so lost, I was just following LPs, and the problem was everyone in the LPs also got lost, so they just <laughs> cut, they just cut to the end of the part where I was lost. <laughs> I think that took me, I think I was on an IGN article just following them step by step trying to figure it out. It was so nuts how confusing it was. And then from there, it was like the easiest thing. But uh, yeah. yeah, dungeons uh, as a whole were good, aside from that. Um, the story isn't anything to write home about, but the good thing is, unlike, say, Persona 4 or 5, where it's four, five, six hours of preamble before you get to your next dungeon, you just rush through some dialogue and then just go. I remember in Persona 4, where like once you got to like Risei's dungeon and stuff, you would just stop, you have to wander all over town, talking to people so you got the right combination of people you talk to, and then they would let you go through the dungeon. It's none of that. You just hop right in. And storyline is so basic. Uh, and I know like the aesthetic of idols in Japan singing uh, anime music is not something that uh, you would probably uh, jump over, like jump for joy over, but the side quests, I would say, is where the characters really excel because they're just so ridiculous and weird. Um, I re was reminded of the side quest where uh, your character Itsuki is wandering around with uh, the girl of the group. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Tsubasa? Oribe. Tsubasa Oribe. And it was something like, oh, we have to find a cat that's wandering around uh, the city. And at one point, you get, a, you get texts on the gamepad. I was playing on the Wii U. You get texts on your gamepad, and she's like, Oh, I stopped searching so I can go to a crepe shop. Don't worry, I think the crepes will draw its attention. And then a little bit later, you get a text saying, Oh, it turns out it was just a raccoon. And it took my crepes. It's, she's just like so wild and weird. And then when you finally <laughs> when you finally find the cat, she just bends over and stares at it for a really long time. And I think she like makes a connection with the cat. And she discovers how to act basically. It's just so ridiculous and stupid. There's one side quest where you have to go through a dungeon finding materials to make a, uh, a potion to cure uh, the hangovers for your boss. Nice. She'll just send you drunk texts asking for your help with a hangover in the middle of the game. And the great and thing about this, these... Yeah, keep going. Oh, I bet you're going to say it. Go ahead. The great thing about the side quests is they are always very rewarding. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. they'll give a, like a cool song, like a music video at the end. They'll give you like a costume from the music video. And then they'll give you like all these skills and abilities. Uh, and, oh, I, the great thing about the combat is all the skills and abilities you get. Like you get session skills, duo arts, that you have to customize your weapons with uh, unity and was, there's radiant unity, there's carnage unity. Your characters have like passive skills that develop separately from their uh, weapon skills, which de develop separately from their just plain leveling up. So when you're in combat, there's almost never a combat encounter where at least one character uh, develops one thing in one way. You'll, they'll either get a new skill from their weapon, or they'll level up, or their stage rank will go up. The higher their stage ranks go up, they get like passive abilities. Uh, when their stage rank gets high enough, uh, they get a bil an ability called Open Audition, which basically makes it so when you're comboing enemies, when you hit a weak spot, you combo enemies, and benched party members can participate in that combo. And you can end up having 10 extra attacks on your enemies and then if you've gotten far enough in the game to get duo art skills uh you have an option between two that you've unlocked and oftentimes they'll heal your entire party or dish out a super attack and then you can keep the combo going i think at my max i hit 11 but i heard on the switch version you can go up to the 20s of just constantly comboing on all of these enemies and you can just lay out an entire group of enemies in like one turn just doing this it is really cool basically yeah. the battle system is smt but instead of like a push what is it the push turn system you just have these everybody on your bench and everybody can just keep coming in 
following each other's attacks and yeah you get it set up right and it wasn't that hard i mean i'm not a person that spends forever setting up my attacks but man there was i, I knew if i could just get like if this person used a fire attack on someone weak to fire it would trigger like a chain of eight every yeah, time like, like itsuki will use a lance attack not itsuki, he doesn't use lance he uses like a sword attack or whatever and then uh, uh subasa will use a lance attack and then all your other characters will will go because they chain together like if this character uses this ability uh another character will chain with that one and use that one and it'll work out that all these characters will mesh together like oh you used an ice attack this character uses a wind attack right after an ice attack and then it just goes like that. And you can really lay them out just doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so. the, the battle system was awesome. And you talk about it being like Persona Light. There was one point um, during the... Because I, I played this April, May... Um, and beat it. And what's funny is I'd been on a podcast the year before and had zero memory of hearing all about it. <laughs> um, I was on a podcast about... I think it was... Oh, um, gosh, what did we talk about... Oh, what's the Etrian Odyssey Persona one? Persona, Persona Q. Q. Yep. Yeah, we did a we did a basically a like a Persona mix podcast where we talked about Persona Q and then Tokyo Mirage Fest. And just, I had zero. I like zoned out that game. Didn't even remember it. And then ended up getting a free copy of this um, when it came out. And just yeah, I went all the way through it. I even outlined an article. I was going to write it. I had the had plenty of time. Uh, wasn't doing much work in the spring, but had a whole article is like how this is the Persona game that like I've always wanted. Like it's quick. It's not a hundred hours. Like this is the Persona like Five I wanted. Yeah, I think I'm. I don't think I hit fifty, but I think I was kind of close because I did all the side quests because they were all great. Hey, you hunt. You help your drunk boss out and do that whatever yeah. stupid quest she has you do, and suddenly like all the shops are ten to twenty percent cheaper. Or something like that. And yeah, or you learn new combo skills and stuff like that. So then you start chaining together, you know, halfway through the game, you're not chaining more than four or five extra attacks together. But by the end, like, I've almost got everybody set up to do eight, no matter what, practically, at a minimum. So I will say, I just bosses were it. pretty rough. <laughs> I had a really uh, hard were... time with bosses. Um, because they, you really can't go with any sort of strategy because they all have like their own gimmick unique to them. Um, so unless you're like reading IGN articles or whatever, game FAQs, knowing ahead of time what they do, you're not going to be able to go and go, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do all, I'm going to have all these characters do all this stuff. No, it's not going to matter. I remember one boss, what was it? There was one boss where like only certain skills could attack them at certain points. Like if they're the color red, you can only hit them with fire attacks. Uh -huh. When they're green green wind and when they're no when they're a neutral color you can hit them with anything that's all critical but then um there's one point where you can hit them and it's all critical but they can land all critical attacks on you crazy nonsense like that oh yeah and it's like the best of all possible attacks sort of it was it was nuts and you couldn't really prepare for any of it and then you also have some other guy standing in the corner attacking you with his sword if, who becomes a nuisance while you're trying to fight this guy yeah i it, i agree with you i was gonna uh, i really thought about putting this on my list and then when you did i was like oh good it's gonna get talked about <laughs> i can leave yeah. this part as my honorable don't have to mention it because i it's a, it's a i had no i no idea ever to play this and luckily like i said someone had an extra copy and sent me the digital code and i geez i had a blast it's a good this kept me from playing play too, because um like you have a tank who has like a ridiculous amount of health, but they also have passive ability if you use them enough in battle that they develop that lets them take damage for you, and that damage is halved, I believe. So like that's if a little you're... girl, right? Yeah, the <laughs> mommery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she'll um like if you're gonna get a hundred damage, she'll hit it with like fifty, and she has like twelve hundred, and she will just sponge up any attack. Like you, like your enemies could be. You can have like four enemies fighting you, and she'll take two or three of them. And most of the time, she's not you know, damaged super hard by them. And then she also has healing abilities, too, so she can heal in between. The only um, downside is that it's a, it's a three-party game. You don't have four party members at once. You can only use three. Uh, you can swap them out pretty generously. Um, it's good to mix them up. I, you don't usually, when you're fighting harder enemies or bosses, 
You generally don't want to keep the same three party members out the whole time. But at the same time, you also can't swap out Itsuki at all. So you can only switch between like two characters out, which is kind of annoying. And if you hit a point where you're in serious trouble, you're spending like large chunks of the boss battle just trying to get back to uh, neutral territory in a safe position where your whole party isn't missing almost all of their health or someone's knocked out or you're just getting steamrolled by a boss. So there is that issue when you're fighting bosses as well. So is this a, uh, a crossover game between Fire Emblem and Persona? There was a bit of a controversy over that uh, because there was a trailer that announced it as a crossover and everyone must have thought that they were going to do like uh, a Fire Emblem game with SMT combat or the other way around. And instead it ended up being basically just a SMT spinoff game that loans uh, Fire Emblem characters Oh, uh, like, mm-hmm. like what? Like what are your per- personas, quote unquote, called in this? Like spirits, performa, something like that. I think it's performa. Yeah, yeah. They're basically and like they're your, basically yeah. They're basically just your shadows or your persona, mm-hmm. basically. And they're SMT or they're um the fire emblem characters. Yeah, they just have like like cooler outfits, look kind of more sinister than their normal counterparts. But it's mostly just a yeah, you know it there. surprises me with the game too that for it being you know this crossover that like. Why didn't some of the characters have, like, a, a Shimagami Tensei character as their uh, performer or whatever they are? It seemed kind of weird that it was only the Fire Emblem characters. Or, like, have it so, like, they each have, like, a Fire Emblem one and an SMT one. You know, do, like, they each have, like, one of each or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. the, unfortunately, I will say that the, the mix of characters isn't great either because it's mostly, like, Awakening characters. Because that was the big game that was out at the time. Everyone knew those characters. So I think, like, Itsuki uses Krom. Um, I believe one of the bosses is... No, one of your one of the other ones is Tharja. Um, one of the bosses is Versa. Um, Gang Girl's a boss. Like, most of the bosses are also just uh, awakening characters, too. So it's more like a, a side Persona game. It's like, hey, here's some Fire Emblem stuff you can use, too, or whatever. Yeah, and I, like the, the, the combat is sort of also Fire Emblem, kind of, in that, like... Oh. You also have a weapons triangle. Oh, like okay. There's scissors, spears, well, yeah, and I, swords. Yeah. I would say it's SMT combat, but all of the like elements and all of the other stuff come from Fire Emblem. Okay, okay. It just seems like you, an yeah, odd you, crossover. It is an odd crossover. <laughs> and then and they then, all like, wrap it's it around. All like... It's wrapped around a J-pop story. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're you're like in a uh, you're you work for an agency, like a uh, a idol agency, where like oh, Mamari, she hosts a cooking show, but she's like ten, so she makes she microwaves instead. <laughs> so she's not act- doing actual cooking; yep. she's just microwaving food. Or like I think Subasa is like the all arounder who does music and acting. Uh, Itsuki is like sort of like a coach. Or he's like just like the cheerleader, basically. Um, like there's one guy who's an actor. There's one guy who does like Sentai shows, Super Sentai shows, oh. and they all they all do like their own little thing. Like one's strictly a musician, stuff like that, basically. It's it's and it's all about their daily lives as famous uh, actors, musicians, stage performers, stuff like that. Yeah, it, it, I, I've got a second that this was one of the better ones, and. Something I would have never played the first time around because I never had the Wii U. Um, something great that they ported the Switch, you know. For JRPG fans, it's it, it it could hit on a lot of different levels. I know probably almost any fan of one of those series would probably not want to play it because of the other yeah. series or something like that, didn't, or just didn't they turn... dismiss it because of the J-pop. But it, honestly, it was fun. I, I liked it. I think they turn um, Tiki into like a little sister character who calls you like big brother. And she's like very moe and has a high pitched voice. And she like hangs out in a little room. It's just so weird. It was very strange. I don't think a lot of uh, uh, Fire Emblem fans would have been super happy with the treatment of a uh, magical character like Tiki as cute sister. Um, but she, I thought it was funny that she, they basically made her Hatsune Miku of that game, of that universe. She's like a little Vocaloid app, basically. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. She can't. She can't join the real world. She hangs out in, like, some room where she does all of your, uh, she upgrades your weapons, stuff like that, basically. You go to her when yeah, you she's your, to, yeah. mm-hmm. Didn't they make her a playable she's character on the Switch one, though? Did they? Like, I saw that you could do sessions with her, but I don't know if you can actually fight with her. The cast is, like... No, I want to say, fight. yeah, she's, like, one... There's a couple different ones that can come in and do a session attack, basically a follow-up. 
Because uh, your boss can, but you can never play with her, but your boss can do a attack. Yeah, I love the boss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, your ancient boss, like the drunk 29-year-old or whatever. Yeah. She's so old. The 20, the so 29 old. woman, yeah. That just yeah. reminds me of that lady from, oh God, what was her name? Sarah, like your your teacher in the first Cold Steel game. Woo! Where she's not that yeah. old, but she's like Drink drunk up. off her ass all the time. <laughs> I did like the games. It, it has that Persona SMT thing where the menus are really great. Um, I liked how it, it was devoted to its, uh, you know, entertainment industry aesthetic. Like your party members are called actors. The ones that are benched are called are on backstage. Uh, when you go to the character, when you look at character stats, they have a little autographs next to their names. Little stuff like that. <laughs> it went all out. It did really go all out. But, I mean, behind, I guess, the combat, I just oh, love the combat. Oh, my God, it was very, so satisfying. I know, right? Very satisfying. those sessions together. And then you get, oh, cool, duo art. Oh, I just sealed my whole party. Perfect. Oh. Mm-hmm. You get so excited. And they do these cool dances, too, when, when they're doing certain abilities. Yep. Yeah, I guess I will say it's very easy to skip through all the songs and all the singing. So if you're not a fan of that, you know. Most of the story. <laughs> it's a pretty quick story. It's, it's, I was going to say, the, it is quick story. Yeah, you're in there for, like... Three to four Very minutes of dialogue, and then it's like, hey, if you're ready, just go to the next place. Boom. I was going to say, how long is the game anyway? Like, what, about, about 40, 40 hours, hours or something? 40-ish. Yeah. Yeah. So, just something to think about when you, next yeah, time you don't have a game to play. <laughs> <laughs> I got enough other RPGs I... to play, but... <laughs> what? No, not He'll be you. back for 2021 Game of the Year for him. <laughs> <laughs> It's all part of the plan for you, and then have a... <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> oh god! I was uh, rubbing my that hands together like a too. Simpsons laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sideshow Bob evil. <laughs> what are you playing? <laughs> <laughs> Hooray for callback references! <laughs> oh yeah, that comes right out of the Halloween episode. <laughs> and uh, also right out of the Halloween episode, and uh, we'll stick with the uh, something big in Japan theme we got going here with uh, Tokyo Mirage Sessions. But Pendy, what's your uh, number two game or games that you put on here? Hell oh, yeah. So speaking of odd crossovers, my second game is the Super, Ro- yeah, Super Robot Wars series. I'm totally cheating with my second entry. I'm going to talk about uh, two of them. Specifically V and T for the PS4. I'm super excited about these games. Super Robot Wars. Huh? 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We get it. Uh, I'm super excited about these games as they are now consistently being released in English. Uh, I touched upon them briefly in a previous side quest where I talked about or I talked more about the original generation games that came to North America back in the GBA, GBC well, GBA days, DS days. Uh, all the more Recent games from this last console generation haven't been released in North America, but they have been released in Southeast Asia. So that means they are now all available in English through importing. They're easy to play as there's no region restrictions with the PS4. I imported all of them through PlayAsia Online, and they all play through my USA account. I did get a Singapore account for them, but that was only to buy some DLC. And when you buy DLC, it automatically transfers to your USA account. So, super simple. Uh, the, but the one con is the Singapore accounts don't take Amer- American payment methods, but you can buy Singapore Station Network card or PSN cards through Play Asia as well, if you want to get around that. So, these games are turn based tactical RPGs where you have an army of mechs or vehicles that you command. All the mechs are from various anime titles uh, between B e and B. E, You've got characters from Gundam, Neon Genesis Evangelion, Cowboy Bebop, Mazinger, Gunsword, Get a Robo, Get a Robo, Full Metal, Full Metal Panic, because for some reason that title has an exclamation point at the end of it. Panic. Full Metal Panic. Each game represents about about 20 different titles on average. In a V, there are two protagonists you can choose from. Both are test pilots, and the mech that you get has this experimental AI character that is self-aware. The plot involves multiple dimensions crossing over with each other, where all these different anime series come from. And in T, you pick between two pilot protagonists that are Japanese salary men. And, and actually, one of them is a salary woman. But the plot involves multiple alien invasions and jokes, references about the Japanese salary man lifestyle. In my opinion, V has the stronger plot. 
the protagonists are stronger characters, and the plot about your mech's AI is more. Uh, both games also interweave various anime plots into their main story. This is a staple of all the SRW games. What's been so fun about these titles? I'm not f- with all the series involved. It, there's so many different uh, maze that I've never even heard of before. But I ended up watching the movie Expelled from Paradise and the show Cross Ange based off the games getting me interested oh. in both of these you uh, watch anime Cross animal Ange? Yes, I'm going to get into that too. I'm going to get into that because <laughs> that has oh. some interesting things about it. Oh, no. So, oh, yeah. So, on a side note, in our side quest, I have to bring up that while Cross Ange is interesting, it's definitely not for everyone, as you can hear EAL <laughs> groan in the background. <laughs> The, the plot of class warfare, depending on whether or not you were born with magic abilities, is interesting, and so is the mech design. The mechs are kind of almost similar to motorcycles in the way that they are designed and driven, but the show is very, very fan service heavy. And uh, one of the weird things about it is no one apparently has nipples, which I found hilarious. I'm guessing it was the show's <laughs> attempt to tone itself down, but it just looks really weird. <laughs> But uh, besides the original generation sequel that I haven't played yet, I'm also looking forward to playing X. Among many other series, it features characters from Code Geass, which I recently finished watching, which I've loved a lot. So uh, I, I, I have to ask, so any thoughts or questions on that one before I go, before we go on? Especially any any comments about Cross Ange throw in there? <laughs> I just didn't expect to come well, in. I'm just sitting here laughing about, about the fact you were like, oh, yeah, nobody's got nipples. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, that's I'm, the first like, thing I'm you notice in games. What did he just say? There's so much, there's so much fan service in it that it, it just becomes really noticeable after a while. It's just it's weird. <laughs> oh, my God. Them crazy Japanese. <laughs> oh, yeah. It makes it, easy to, uh, makes it easy to censor when there's no nipple there. They got that Barbie doll anatomy. That's what they got. Yeah. <laughs> just a very it's interesting fun. pick of all the franchises that are uh, represented in this game it's like, oh let's watch cross age that's the one oh it's well i mean the the game that it, it's involved in it goes through uh that the plot from the anime is very heavily involved into the game so like i learned a lot about the anime from just playing the game and i was like oh well this seems kind of interesting and then i ended up watching the anime to kind of you know see what it was really about and then kind of learned how like well i mean it's kind of obvious in the game that it's a little fan service heavy but then you get into the anime and it's like holy crap guys jeez obviously <laughs> you know written for like horny 13 year old teenagers at, at, at some point but it's but beyond that it's actually i thought it had kind of an interesting uh plot and characters to it so but buyer beware on that one great character development yeah <laughs> <laughs> they very involved <laughs> plot <laughs> i watch it for the plot <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, well, you're not watching it for the nipples. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> I, oh. it, you, you got what I meant by that joke, though, right? Didn't you? <laughs> oh, wait, you don't watch YouTube. There's always sarcastic videos on YouTube where, in quotes, it says, I watch X series for the plot. And it's always just like the fan servicey bits of the video. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes. I mean, I'm old enough that Playboy actually used to be a printed magazine. That people actually read for the stories. Printed magazine? What? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Wasn't just that channel, number 375, on your uh, satellite dish. <laughs> what was the password? <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously password. 1234. Come on. <laughs> Q W E R T Y? But which is capitalized? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pandy, anything else you need to go into with uh, those games? No, that's all I have on it. I'm just, just uh, if you like turn-based tactical RPGs and you're into like a lot of anime that's heavy into mechs, like it's a fantastic mix of all of that together, and it's a fun time. Nice. All right, then uh, we'll move on to my number two story um, or number two game. Uh, it's Golf Story. That's why I got there. The word story in there. Um, this is something actually I wanted to play a couple of years back, right when I got my Switch. I don't know where I heard it, that it was a golf RPG. And I was like, oh, shit, I want to play a golf RPG. Um, gosh, going back to like 99, playing Mario Golf on the N64. I loved that game. And then I played, I think it was the GBA one, 
really love that. And someone was like, oh, well, golf stories and RPG with like Mario Golf type golfing. I was like, oh, my gosh, yes. I'm in there. Um, and I don't know where I looked it up initially. Like I saw it on sale at one point a couple of years back, right when I got my Switch. And I looked it up wrong or I typed in the wrong thing. And I saw something that it was going to be like a 40 hour game. And I was like, nope, I got enough long games. I'll, I'll get to that one day. And I think it was right after I finished Tokyo Mirage Sessions. And I was, I played Tokyo Mirage Sessions. I played Rune Factory. Um, for review, I got both those games free. I was making it really good with one of my uh, 2020 goals was to spend no money on video games, I, or at least not for me. I was going to buy games just for the kids and me to play, but my backlog is such that I don't need to go buy myself any new games. And I was playing Trails of Cold Steel, or not Cold Steel, but Trails in the Sky 2, and it got right to the end of may and then frickin nintendo had a late spring or early summer sale and talking about pop the cherry that was it i bought golf story and um graveyard keeper in the same sale and looking up golf story and i was like gosh man golf story's just been in the back of my head for like over a year now and i look it up and I'm like oh it's like a 10 12 hour game or something like that what the hell was i thinking like it was 40 i don't know what my head so i bought it and plowed through it in like two weeks and had a blast um it is a tongue-in-cheek humor the entire time uh, you're this like local kid at the golf range and the whole time they're like well you suck but you know we'll coach you anyway you got oh god you suck you won a tournament well yeah it was just luck you suck whatever and you even your coach the whole time is telling you like ah, you know whatever i guess i'll keep coaching you um and it's just a lot of just goofy humor and you go through about seven or eight different golf courses um but what's funny is it's very much an rpg because you're leveling up your stats like you level up do you want to have a you be able to hit the ball straighter do you want to be able to hit it longer um, you put skill points into different things. There's different every time you get to a new um, golf course, you can walk all around the clubhouse area and the entrance. And there's all these people offering you side quests. Um, someone's like, hey, you want to do a chip in challenge? You know, I bet you can't chip it in as well as me. And you actually have to like play against like NPCs and everything and little things. Um, and my God, some of them just get ridiculous. They end up with, uh, what's the Frisbee? Lawn golf. At one point, that is a big thing. And man, I was going to rage quit on that freaking side quest at one point because it's not just hit the ball and it goes straight. You're like jamming the control sticks as it's flying and it's spinning and going and Holy crap, you're, I think it appears also on this one area that's like a really windy golf course. So you're like 18 mile an hour winds and you're trying to throw this freaking Frisbee and you have to curve it around a tree to make it into the thing. I was like, oh my God, no way. Um, but uh, I mean, it was, I, I had a blast. I even uh, had started playing it like pretty much the day before we went on our uh, big vacation in North Carolina we do every year. And we drive overnight, and my wife usually takes, like, the first three or four-hour um, shift, and usually I'll try to maybe get an hour of sleep a little bit so I can wake up at midnight when we need gas, and then I drive midnight all the way through to 6, 7 a.m. And this game, I couldn't put it down. I'm, like, sitting in the passenger seat, playing all the way through Florida, halfway through Georgia till midnight, just like, oh, my gosh, I can do it, I can do it. Um, it was just an absolute blast. Um, and the developers, oh, I can't remember their name off the top of my head. I meant to look that up. But they were supposed to have a sequel to the game come out this year. It was supposed to come out over the summer called uh, Sports Story. And it looks absolutely effing hilarious. Uh, the publisher Sidebar Games, um, a little independent group from uh, down under, down there in Australia, uh, they're supposed to have, and it should come out this year. Thank you, COVID, or in the next year, 2021. By the time you're listening to this podcast, it'll probably be 2021. But uh, Sports Story is supposed to come out, and it looks off the wall, like even crazier. I think there was a scene in the trailer of like someone using a badminton to smash, um, or badminton racket to smash, yeah, like a baseball or something like that. And it, it just looks like blends of other different types of stuff instead of just being sports. And the humor is just hilarious. Heck, they had a whole video 
um, just to announce that it was going to be delayed. And that like one two minute video with um, the coach, it just cracked me up from what he was saying. And like the one guy's like trying to tell you like, oh, we're going to be delayed. And the other one's like, oh, but we want to tell you about what's going to be in it like this and this. I'm like, shut up, coach. Don't tell them everything. Um, but if you ever played the old Mario Golf, um, any of the Mario Golfs, it's the gameplay is just that wrapped up in RPG mechanics with just humor all the time. It, it I was chuckling every 10, 15 minutes. I swear every side quest I was doing just had me laughing. And I haven't really played a golfing game since probably the GBA um mario golf and i was still able to do this and do pretty good at this game because you do have to win tournaments to move on so at some point you know a lot of the side quests if you do it whatever you just get some extra money to buy some better clubs or buy some better um equipment that'll help you in the game but if you can't do them whatever you can't do them um i, I didn't do all of them i probably did 90 percent of them and oh evan was it you i was talking to about the golf game that's baked into this did we talk no, about that I, this summer I, I remember there was that they made a good cart for the nes specifically for it golf golf yes you can play golf in there at one point you like go into somebody's room and like you're like oh there's an old cartridge sitting here do you want to put it in and play it and it's golf which is a really weird golf game and yeah, sure, the limited run games actually has it. They made a NES title, Galf, and put it out for and release it. So I it, it it's got inside jokes with itself. And so I, I can't wait for Sports Story. It's been delayed six months already, and I'm like, no, what's taking so long? Come on, Australia. I saw you had zero new cases last week. Zero. <laughs> Get back to work. Come on, guys. <laughs> Come on, guys. You losers. Come on. <laughs> Cowards. So that that has definitely been uh, one of my best games of the year. It might only be 10, 15 hours, but it, it's completely something different. And, you know, how many other golf RPGs are there out there? Lee Carvalho's putting challenge. <laughs> you have selected power drive. <laughs> 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 What's funny is that there was another one that I saw. Oh, yeah, there's a it's not very well reviewed, but I did see something else because somebody had asked if it's what I was talking about. I can't remember where I was posting one day. And they're like, oh, did you mean this? There's a game and it's on Steam and it may be out for something else. Uh, probably on mobile. Oh, heck, it's on Steam for a buck fifty right now. It's called RP Golf. <laughs> Sounds like a bootleg. It, it, well, I... It does not look as uh, like it does as well as the uh, other one. And gosh, I, I think somebody said that this was out for mobile even well before the other one. So who knows? So it's like the Dragon Warrior uh, monsters of uh, monster games. <laughs> so this, yeah, this one released May 9th, 2018. It, you know, it's got a lot of reviews on Steam, total of 25 and it's still hanging in the 60s. So not a lot of people play it. But I think they're they're actually coming out with another game too. I saw that. With zombies or something like that. Or like zombie RP golf. I don't know, but whatever. Stick with the uh stick with the better one. Golf story on your Switch. And let me tell you, um, I heard about it on a podcast first and I had to eventually turn it off. My God, does it rumble your switch like crazy? <laughs> it definitely uses the rumble with the uh, Joy Cons, and it's loud. Is it, it as it, bad as a Pokemon Sword and Shield that destroyed my speakers on my Switch? Oh, you know, I I played Shield completely, or I played Sword. I played Sword completely on my Switch Lite, so and mainly the, muted. So the rumble was so intense for a uh, Gigantamax and Dynamax battles that I was just in the middle of one, and like my Pokemon was defeated, and all of a sudden my speaker stopped working. Because of how hard it was shaking. Oh, jeez. You know, I wonder if I turned that option off for my son. Because he was even playing it in the backseat of the car today, and I didn't notice anything. It's loud, too. Like, you can hear the rumble. Like, if, if, you, if you put it down on, like, a pillow, you can hear it rumbling. <laughs> I bet I turned that off. Because I played with him on his game for many hours on Veterans Day. So... That might have been something I disabled right away. Because <laughs> I, I, on Golf Story, I had to get rid of that pretty quickly. I was like, this is, I can't play it in bed at night. <laughs> My wife's looking over at me like, what the hell's going on there? I'm like, no, you're just playing golf, you know, as you will. 
All right, Yangus, go ahead and finish up our number twos, and then we're going to have a special guest number one before we talk about our number ones. Ooh, a special Ooh. guest. <laughs> it's not like I already don't know who it is, but... <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, so my number two, and actually this will continue um, with some of the things that Pendy was talking about with Dragon Quest of the Stars, but my number two game this year was actually uh, a mobile game and a gotcha game as well uh, called Romancing Saga Reuniverse, or as I usually just shorthand it to, uh, Saga Universe. So this game originally came out in 2018 in Japan and released here in the West in the summer of 2020. Uh, the game is essentially a quote-unquote sequel to Romancing Saga 3 and takes place about 300 years after that game in the same world. Uh, basically, the story is that the uh, world is starting to experience these strange towers that are appearing all over the place that are called Graves, which is just the nickname that have been, has been given to them by the populace. And uh, the Kingdom of Loan, which is a major um, kingdom in Romancing Saga 3, uh, their current leader is trying to figure out, you know, why these are all appearing everywhere, you know, why exactly that whenever you go into them and come finish them off and, you know, reach the top and open the doors at the top of them, why there are heroes and people who are claiming they're from other worlds and monsters who are from other worlds and essentially why this is happening within their world. Uh, at the same time, since this is, uh, just for a bit of story for Mancing Saga 3, since this is taking place at a 300 year mark, they also have to worry about the potential rise of Morstrom which is essentially when the sun is eclipsed by the moon, or as they call it, the dark star, and all life that's born in that year will completely die off. But there's a chance that there could be one survivor who could either be a force for good or a force for evil, which is the same thing that happened and you learn about in Romancing Saga 3. Anyway, with Romancing Saga uh, Universe, your main character is this boy named Polka Lint Wood, and he is trying to, for one, escape from his old uh, boss, Bartholomew, who's chasing after him and his sister, but he also is trying to find where his sister was taken to, and eventually in the story you do end up saving his sister. Uh, her name is Liz. Uh, she ends up joining him as well, but with Polka, the main character, he is actually what's called a Grave Knight, and is the title given to the people who can easily traverse through these towers, known as the Graves, because the the big thing with these graves is that, like I said a little bit ago, uh, whenever you climb up to the top of them, and if someone is able to open the doors, then a what's called an other world warrior will come along and help you out or you know they'll just be in the world now to help out and essentially until this crisis is over it's basically the game's reason for having all of these characters from the other saga games showing up like from saga from romancing saga one and two the saga frontier games uh you even have characters from the original game boy trilogy of saga games showing up as well all the way up to like the newest releases and even some of the mobile games that japan got uh but anyway so look, uh, Polka is basically called a Grave Knight because he's able to enter these towers, see these visions from these heroes and uh, characters' lives. And as the game goes on, you know, certain ones will join up with him. Uh, it's eventually revealed that there are there are eight new stars of destiny, just like there were 300 years ago to try and help, you know, change the world's balance, whether it's going to be, you know, one for good or one for evil. So... The big thing with this game, since it is a gotcha game, is that you do have the randomness element for characters who join you and for what armor you get. Uh, the big draw with this one is that, like I said, it's characters from all of the different Saga games showing up to help you out. So, like, when I first started the game, you know, it gave me some characters from Saga 2, or from, excuse me, from Romancing Saga 2, Romancing Saga 3, and then I got a few from Saga Frontier 1. Um, so you you get a good variety of characters, and as the game's been updated over the past few months, it's gotten more and more characters from games that weren't quite as represented, or you have new styles that show up for characters that uh, perhaps only had, like, one in particular. Uh, for this game, too, I... <laughs> Like Pendy, who's been playing Dragon Quest of the Stars since launch every day. This is a game that I've been playing every day since it launched. And according to the game this evening at 7 o'clock, when um, it updated for the next day, it said that I had been playing the game for 183 days straight since it's launched back in the summertime. <laughs> Pendy just put in the chat that that's completely weak. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my game came out in like June. Give me a break. <laughs> Rookie but, um, numbers, man. You got to pump those up. <laughs> Okay, I'll, Evan, I'm, what's the I'll, game that you played for like a thousand days in a row? Oh yeah, Love Love Live, which is probably way worse. Um, I think I'm over. <laughs> I'm actually checking right now. I think it's over a thousand. Oh man, they they have a tracker for you. 
uh, rewards you. <laughs> yeah. But um, with this game, you do have a lot of uh, elements from the Saga games, like for how combat works, you can form parties of five characters. Uh, you have different form uh, formations you can set them up in. And like those games, characters will have different weapons they're a little more proficient with. You'll have characters who are better with magic. Uh, but unlike regular Saga games where you can sort of customize characters how you want to, or if you, you know, you could look it up and see like what they might be better with. Uh, with this game, you have characters, everyone has a particular weapon that they're better with. Like the more magic oriented characters are going to be able to only equip like a magical rod or a staff. Uh, you have swordsman characters like uh, Gerard from Romancing Saga 2, who's going to be able to use a great sword or the final emperor from that game who can use um also uses great swords and things like that uh but the key is that when you get into combat characters will gain you know stat level ups from battles and they'll un they'll spark new abilities uh, as you fight usually everybody has three abilities that they'll be able to learn but they can also inherit skills from uh the other versions of themselves so like for example uh, i have three versions of uh, Gerard from Romancing Saga 2, and there's one s rank version of him and two ss rank versions of him that I have. Uh, there's three ranks. You have A-rank, which is your lowest, your S-rank, which is your middle, and SS-rank is the top one. But the thing is, you're still better off using characters, or like the same character in different ranks, depending on your situation. Because, like, let's say you want a character who's a little bit faster, like regular S-rank Gerard might be have a, have a higher agility stat than his uh, double S-rank versions of himself or you need him to be a little stronger so you can use uh, one of his SS rank versions or one of them that has a little bit better uh, wisdom for magic attacks like that because he can't because some characters are they can use a little bit of both so what's nice is that if you do train up a character uh, whether it's in going into like quests and missions and events and things like that or if you use the expedition feature which lets you train a character and you just come back within like so many hours of real world time or use the expedition tickets to speed things along uh, they'll be able to gain stat gain and even if you jump between different styles, uh, the character will still have relatively the same amount of, or the same number of stats. Just, you know, if you jump between one that's a little higher ranked than another, there might have some stats that are going to be a little higher uh, numbered than, there are, than the others. But you could also have the same case where your A rank version of a character could be a lot faster and have better luck versus the higher rank version, which might have better strength and just better defense overall. So you have to sort of judge the situation you're going into in combat. And I do appreciate that from having played uh, numerous games of the Saga series at this point. But um, with this game too, I actually got interested in this, in this one because in late 2019, uh, Platy and I, we've done a yearly RPG race uh, since 2017. And for 2019, we decided to pick Romancing Saga 2. It was after we chose that and we're about to start it that we learned that it's actually one of the hardest games in the series. <laughs> By race, he means a series of DNFs by one of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been the every case year, one of us does not finish. Yep. And with, with the Ranting Saga 2's case, just to go a little side story here, um, Platy had gotten a good start on it, but when I had, uh, when it came first time to start it, I was not feeling that well uh, last year around um, this time of the year. So I didn't really get a head start on it until like a day or two after he did. But then. You got, what, like 30 or 40 hours into it, Platy, before you just were like, ah, I think I'm going to put it to the side? It was about 24, 25, yeah, it was mid-20s. I knew okay. I hit 20-something. Okay, so yeah, Platy got to that point, and I had kind of kept dabbling with it over the months um, as we, like, after we had started that race. But it was a game that really never left my mind. It's one that I wanted to keep going back to and finish it, even though it was really frustrating at points. And when... Um, Saga Universe was coming out. I, you know, saw on some gaming websites that it was coming. It's like, you know, that, that you know, it's part of that same series with Romancing Saga too. So maybe I should go back and finish it. And um, here we are, uh, like 183 days later after playing it. You know, I've really gotten into the Saga Universe as a mobile game and just you know enjoying the heck out of it. And because of that game, it's motivated me to go back and finish Romancing Saga two, which I did last month, and really enjoyed finally finishing that game off. And it's um, over this, these last few months of playing Saga Universe on my phone, it's gotten me more and more interested in the series as a whole and learning more of its history, what systems it came out on. And luckily, uh, the Square Enix has really done a good job supporting the series, especially nowadays, because like we have Romancing Saga 2 and 3 you can play on so many different devices. Uh, there's the remaster of Saga Frontier coming out next year in the, in the summertime, you know, depending on COVID. Uh, the recent collection of Saga came out, which is the original Game Boy trilogy. So... 
it, it was nice to see that even though this is a series that like of Square Enix's big three RPG series, uh, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and Saga, you know, Saga's kind of lower on the tier, but or it, like lower in terms of, you know, being well known and popular and things like that. It's at least nice to see Square Enix is like, like with Dragon Quest, they're really trying to, you know, push and support the series as best they can. And I've really enjoyed my time with Saga Universe because, for one thing, this game is very generous. Like, I have gotten so many new characters, um, the expedition tickets, new armor, and weapon upgrade items, and so many other things just by logging in every day. I think part of that might also be because, you know, we're about a year and a half or so behind the Japanese release but at the same time, it's been a nice motivation to keep playing. And from this game, I've only the only real world money that I've spent on it was a dollar for uh, the welcoming pack, which was like a hundred free summoning tickets and like some like five hundred gems you could use for summons and stuff like that. So I haven't spent any money other than that one dollar on this game, but I've gotten a ton of a ton back in return, and I've really enjoyed uh, you know seeing all these different character crossovers. I really enjoy the team building aspect of the game. And uh, really, like, even though I'm a, a newer fan to this series, like, and, you know, as the months have gone on, like, I've kind of learned more and more about the series and the characters and things like that. It's still been really cool to see all these things show up because I've looked other places and people are really excited. Like, oh, hey, there's this character now from uh, Saga Frontier. Or, oh, there's this character now from Saga Scarlet Grace. So it's cool that even though I'm a newer fan to see sort of the fan reactions from people like um, one of our guests we've had on for a few episodes, uh, Matt Craft, uh, also Ryu, whichever name he's going by now <laughs> he's he's a big fan of this series as well and i remember when we were talking about it at one point like he kept telling me oh i haven't been able to get ss rank uh, uh rouge from uh, saga frontier and i t remember telling him like oh yeah that was one of the characters i got like a few weeks after playing it and he's like oh you son of a <laughs> But it's been fun, you know, sharing some of those experiences with people and like what characters you get and, you know, what sort of characters to try and look out for, maybe to try and use your, your free gems or your ticket pools to try and get. Like, I've been really happy recently they added in the other protagonists from Saga Scarlet Grace, which it's a game that I did start a little bit last year when we were doing the, the Romancing Saga 2 race, Patty and I were, but I, did, but I put a stop on it since I didn't want to get too far into that one when I was still playing another Saga game. But it's been cool seeing these other characters from these games show up. And um, like I said, it's gotten me more and more interested in the series as a whole. And really, this is just a game that I have just been able to even like even if I just put a few minutes into it every day, it's still really fun to go back into because there's tons of events, lots of free stuff that you get. And it, there's a lot of great music too. like Kenji Itoi, who's the usual series composer for these games. He has some really great rearrangements for his songs. Like right now there's a big Christmas event going on. Uh, it had a lot of thank yous for, you know, everybody supporting the game for over a year here in the West and, you know, people just supporting the game for two years straight in Japan. And they gave out a ton of free stuff and it has this great um, orchestrated version of the Padori theme, which is a town that you go to in Romancing Saga 3 as the uh, new hub theme for the for the village because it's all Christmas themed and everything. So there's been a lot of really cool stuff like that. And they've done other events like a big party celebration for Romancing Saga 3's anniversary. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing what else they're going to do with it. And again, for this being a series that I'm just recently becoming a fan of, uh, starting from last year with Romancing Saga 2, I've really enjoyed getting to know this series over the past year. And I really have to thank Romancing Saga Reuniverse for that. And it's probably a game that I'm going to keep playing until they decide to stop supporting it. But I hope that's not for a long time. But, you know, if you're just looking for a new RPG with some fun customization elements to it and a lot of or, or basically a gateway to sort of get into this Saga series, then I'd say give uh, Saga Universe a shot. It's one that I downloaded just by a chance from having tried out another game in the series, and I haven't regretted it since. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to playing more of this game and more of the Saga games as a whole. All right. Well, if you're looking to give a shot to someone, we're going to give a shot to uh, Austin Erevar right now. Uh, he was on our previous episode, but he was having some internet issues that night. So on our last episode, he uh, talked about his third best game. He talked about his second best game. But unfortunately... Uh, the ISP gods decided that he was done for the night and uh, cut him off. And he he was in our Skype chat for a little bit. He, bit. he was there and out and there and out. And finally, he was just like, well, this isn't going to work. But I had a chance to talk to him the other day. I'm going to put that audio in right now. And after he talks about his favorite game from 2020, 
uh, we'll be back with all of ours. We've got Aust here, uh, had some internet problems last week, but he's back to talk about his number one favorite game he played in 2020. So, Aust, what was that game again? That game is Stellaris. Stellaris. Yeah. I definitely wanted to get you back on to hear about this, because when you were talking about it, I was like, ooh, I used to play a lot of games like these in the early 2000s. Yeah. Ahead, take uh, it away. I even I even name dropped it uh, when I was talking about Crusader Kings, and I was mm-hmm. like, I'll talk about this later, and then I didn't, <laughs> because <laughs> the internet kicked me off the podcast. Well, it's later. You're here. <laughs> Here we go. Yep. So this is the game that I've easily played um, the most in 2020, aside from Dragon Quest X, because I put another 400 hours into that this year. But um, yeah, so I checked my Steam playtime for for Stellaris, and it says 220 hours. And oh my. <laughs> I only got it, I think I got it in March, because um, mm-hmm. they, they do a free weekend very often on steam where you can just you can you can play for the whole week play the game the whole weekend for free and then after that it was on sale for like 50 percent off so i i grabbed it right away after putting playing about 20 hours of it for free um it's it's uh there's there's a little um tagline that i noticed on all of the uh store art for this game and i don't remember who who what site said it but they just uh summed the game up as immense (laughs) Uh, which it really is Um, it has a lot of replayability it's uh there's there's a ton of mechanics in this game it's it's made by the same company that makes crusader kings as i um i was talking about in the last podcast uh it's made by the same company so there's some slight similarities in terms of combat but that's really where that ends the only other thing it has in common is just how much stuff is going on under the hood there are tons of uh, little mechanics that you don't really notice at first sight. Um, there are, for example, I guess like uh, when you've got a neighbor and you're bordering them, like you've got a whole host of different uh, factors for why they may or may not like you. Um, border friction is an obvious one if you, if you share a border with them. That automatically usually gives you like a slight negative penalty to your relation with them just because you're so close and you know you might be settling some of the same areas uh if you share similar ethics as in like say you have say you're playing as a species that's militaristic and and uh xenophobic like space racists you just want to go through and conquer every planet and enslave other species you can do that you can even have uh your laws set up so that you declare you consider certain species to be sub sentient i guess since they're not oh wow yeah you can you can set it up so that you you look at uh different species as chattel uh use them as slaves or if you want to go to the extremes just completely purge them from your empire uh and you for that you have to you have to build purge facilities to actually like funnel them into to do that that's the uh that's the darkest side of the game i've actually never played that type of uh empire before because it's really hard to pull off uh obviously everyone in the galaxy will hate you if you're playing that sort of um that sort of game so Mm -hmm. it's the cards are stacked against you and i mean you're literally space hitler at that point uh so it's (laughs) it's it's hard to um it's hard to build up a fleet to defend yourself when everybody else is trying to put an end to, you know, your wicked ways. I generally, when I play, I generally go for the um, Star Trek-esque, you know, utopian, progressive utopia, where I've got like a federation with some of the other more um, egalitarian races in the galaxy. Uh, and, and that's just as difficult for other reasons, because... You tend to gravitate towards policies that center around conservation, I guess, and you can't use every resource at your disposal. So, um, I mean, I could talk about this all day and go into detail, but there are um, there are natural, like, just for one example, there are space amoebas that you can encounter, and you can choose to use them uh, to to eradicate them or use their i guess harness their natural abilities to use toward like 
research on them and use them for your own weapons. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if your species has certain ethics, you may not want to do that. Um, Trying to think of how to really talk about this without spending three hours because... (laughs) Well, so this many... is one of those 4X games, right? The Explore, Exploit, Expand, mm-hmm. and oh, what's the last one? Explore, was... Expand, ex... is Exterminate one of them? I can never remember that, that m- either. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it's just an empire building. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's uh, it's very similar to Civilization, you know, Sid Meier's Civilization in that regard, but it's not turn-based for one, it's real-time. Oh, but, okay. Yeah, and you think that would be a big game changer but it's really not um there are four different game speeds you can change it to at any time fast fastest normal slow and slowest so not Mm -hmm. four that's five right uh (laughs) and so like you can you can turn it all the way up to fastest to to just get like during the really slow parts when you're not at war and stuff just to get through things um sometimes when i'm working from home i'll have a game going and just have it on the slowest speed and if something pops up i'll go deal with it but usually not a lot is is going on at that speed and you can pause it at any time so it's not it's not a it's it's real time but it's not what you're thinking of when you hear real time strategy it's not like age of empires where you have to keep your eyes glued to the screen at all times Mm -hmm. yeah i remember you know other than the civilization games gosh i think it was late 90s early 2000s there's one of these I loved called Masters of Orion and then Masters mm-hmm. of Orion 2. I, I'm sure I sunk hundreds of hours into those. Yeah, I've never played those, but from what I understand, this is very much uh, a spiritual successor to that, mm-hmm. though it, it has more to it. They definitely took a lot of inspiration from Master of Orion. Yeah, I've, I've looked at some of the videos since you mentioned you were going to talk about this, and it's a big reason I want to get you back on because personally, I was like, "Ooh, this looks fun." Yeah, it's it's um, I've played I've played quite a few different forex games, uh, mostly Civilization, um, just because that's like the standard, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's 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 very approachable and and everything, and it's fun and has that depth but i'm pretty certain after playing this this one's my favorite um, nice. so combat wise how nitty-gritty does it get in with the space combat can you like it, control a certain ship or do you see the whole thing taking yeah, place yeah you can see it take place um combat is very simple it's not uh you don't have very much control over it it's really just a numbers game mm-hmm. you um you have what are called fleets and you you obviously you um, let's say you construct one ship you can add it to that fleet uh, there's I usually use the fleet manager view which allows you to set up like several different fleets and then you can specify how many ships you want in each fleet and then just hit reinforce and it'll automatically fill that fleet up till its capacity okay um, so you control each fleet I guess as if it were a unit and you have like a fleet power so which is a number uh so you however many ships are in that fleet um determines your fleet power and essentially you just want a higher fleet power than what you're attacking Mm -hmm. so it's it's uh when you move into a star system it's kind of i guess like risk in that that sense you just uh you you make sure you have a higher number you move in and you know you can zoom in and watch the pretty you know lights and and uh, ray guns and all of that going on the 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 enemy the spaceship fire. Uh, but very often I'm usually like in the broad galactic view. Mm-hmm. And if I'm like if I'm do, if I'm at, at a um, if I'm in a big battle or a big war, I'll just send in some fleets into a star system and not even zoom in and then just go elsewhere on the map and mm-hmm. and let it do its thing. But that's I mean that's pretty much it. Combat's not too complicated. It's it's not even it's not even the biggest part of the game. A lot of it has to do with diplomacy and stuff. But I mean it's it's definitely a constant factor. Like you're not going to get through a game without going without combat. Uh, but it's not um, not not the dead center focus. All right. Yeah, that's what I remember about Master of Orion too. I would it was always the negotiating and the expansion and the science tree that was I would spend most of my time on or. Mm-hmm. And even after a while, um, you know, I'd, I'd get a certain planet or a certain star system going a certain way and then just click the auto build button from then on. And it's yeah. like, listen, you're not one of my, you know, top five areas. So just build up, build whatever. <laughs> Become right. okay. 
become okay. Do 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 well for yourself and contribute some money in taxes. Yeah, yeah. And once you get to a certain part in this game, about halfway or towards end game, you you really have to do that too. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have a big empire, because you just can't manually manage all of it. Oh um, yeah. There, there's uh, how big does it get? Like, like how big do the galaxies get? How many star systems and stuff like that? Oh, I'd have to look at the exact number, but you can choose at the beginning, you know, if you want to do small, tiny, huge. Mm -hmm. um, some of the very, the very, I haven't played on the very largest ones because I've read that it can take quite a while before you even find another empire at the beginning just because there's so much. It's mm -hmm. it's so big. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, you can the customization for game rules is is crazy. Uh, they can get pretty big, and they or they can be as small as you want them to be. Nice. I can, I can probably look up real quick how big the uh, huge yeah, star system is. I was trying to remember, like for I mean, in gosh, somebody made a kind of Masters of Orion clone. I think I paid like five dollars for on the iPad like eight years ago. I'm like, wow, this. The interface even looked very similar in both of those games. I don't think it got much more than above 100 star systems. Oh, um, that's definitely more than 100. Um, I, I kind of figured at this point with... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. thinking 96 computers and Gen 1 iPads. Yeah, they. it's, it's uh, definitely... Okay, here's a list. So, uh, Tiny, the Tiny Galaxy is 200 stars. Oh, uh, small is 400, medium is 600, large is 800, and huge is 1,000. Okay, so yeah, that that's it's a whole mag order of magnitude. Yeah, <laughs> bigger and than my something games I've read. I've played. Something I've read, and this may be more true. I'm, well, I'm sure it is more true on lower hardware machines. But um, when you get to end game for some of these very large galaxies, there's just so much for your computer to have to process it's not even it's not even the graphics it's just like the population for each planet's moving around and and they're you know calculating like employment and all of that stuff it's so much for it to handle in the huge galaxies that some people only get to play half of the game before their computer <laughs> stops being able to really keep up oh, i mean i can see that yeah you've got a thousand star systems do they have multiple planets and star systems uh some yeah some of them do have multiple planets mm -hmm. some of them have no habitable planets it depends yeah. on your species like you can have some species that inhabit Arctic worlds or desert worlds. So uh, what's what's habitable to some species won't be habitable to others. There's a good variety of uh, different types of planets all throughout different or star systems. So mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. All right. Well, this is a game that uh, it's probably on GOG as well. Yep, it's on GOG, Steam. I think I even saw that it's available on the Microsoft Store for Game Pass. So if you have if you sign up for Game Pass, you can play it for free. Oh, there you go. But um, when when the podcast is supposed to go live, uh, what day? Uh, probably I'll have it up on the thirty first. Okay. Well, I saw on Steam and GOG that it's on sale for seventy five percent off until January fifth. So okay. So yeah, if you catch this early enough, you'll definitely mm -hmm. be able to catch that. Yep. It's nice. it's definitely worth it, in my opinion. After 220 hours, I'd say uh, your opinion carries a lot of weight there. <laughs> yep, there's a lot to do, and there, there are tons of mods that you can play with. There's even Star Wars and Star Trek mods that are very well done, uh, if uh, that's the sort of thing you're, you're into. All right, well, thank you, Aus, for coming back on and talking about it. Time to move on to Evan. Let's talk our number one favorite titles of the year that we played so as I foreshadowed with a very subtle cough I did earlier when uh, Yanks <laughs> was talking about his Operation the Operation Rainfall games, I'll be talking about the last story. Um, so basically, you play as Zale. He's a part of a mercenary outfit, uh, along with his friend Dagrin, Sarin, Marania, Yurik, Lol, Callista. I did write those names down, but I remembered almost all of them off the top of my head. Uh, Zale ends up with a mark on his hand while on a mission with the rest of them that gives him a mysterious power that acts as a game mechanic later on. It's a uh, gathering. Basically what it does is it draws enemies that are attacking your whole party directly to you, and you fight them while your, the rest of your party gets a chance to uh, cast spells uh, because it has like a little bit of meter, like about five seconds or so, and you don't control them. Uh, so the game has a weird, has a weird sort of combat. I'll get to it later. But basically, the story is 
uh, Zale's kind of like, he wants more out of life than just being a, uh, a mercenary. Uh, and they end up on Lazulus Island where he ends up meeting a girl named Lisa. They hang out. They have a great time. Falls in love. And then Dagrin's like, all right, we got a mission uh, or whatever. We got a job. We're going to be a guard for the Count of Lazulus Island, Count Arganon. Uh, we are going to be the guards for this wedding for his niece. And his niece is Lisa. She's getting married. Uh, her actual name is Callista. And at that point, he starts getting wrapped up in the politics of Lazlus Island. They're at war with the Garak, these giant, you know, fantasy monster guys who are also kind of human in that they're smart, they're intelligent, they have a leader. Uh, and uh, it's a. I really appreciated the cast. It probably has like one of the best RPG casts I've ever seen because it, there was just like. When you get into combat, they just chit chat back and forth. They talk about, oh, do this thing, do that thing. Oh, these guys, they're really on our tail. Oh, we can't shake them. They, they chit chat back and forth. They quip. Um, they're all pretty memorable. They all have like one defining characteristic, but they all have like their own. Like they all like kind of go beyond just that. Like Sarin, she's not just the fun drunk, or uh, you know, Marania isn't just the quiet, you know, mousy girl who's the the mage of your group or whatever. She also is a voracious eater, fun stuff like that. And uh, I found the story very engaging. It was probably like they said, it's a great story. Like it's a little over dramatic, but that's kind of like the fun of an RPG. Personally, to me, I always enjoy the way over dramatic. Oh, this this crazy plot thing happens. Oh, this twist happens. This happens. Oh, the, the the princess, or in this case, you know, the niece of the count, she's marrying someone else, but she loves you. And what I thought was really cool was Callista. She's actually like a party member. She doesn't just like stand on the sidelines while you do all the fighting for her. She like, there's a scene where she just rips her dress and gets into, gets into combat mode with you. And she's like your healer for a decent chunk of the game. But uh, so basically the combat. So combat is kind of weird. It's like a sort of a, a, a tactical, a little bit of tactical, but it's mostly an action RPG where you can basically just walk, walk right up to enemies and uh, Zale auto attacks. He just goes and you don't have to press any buttons to do this move or do that move. Um, but there is a little bit of, uh, you know, planning. You, you, you can dodge, but you also have to manage what your other party members are doing. You usually get about four, five, six other party members in your group and they all act autonomously, but you can direct them to do certain things like have this character uh, cast a magic circle or attack the enemy this way because they're weak to this spell. Or, you know, maybe I want Callista or Marania to do a healing circle. Um, the way magic works is so, for example, healing circle, uh, it's a giant circle that you just step right in and it heals your characters. And there's no, spe there's no like, items you use to get a quick heal. You just walk right into the circle and uh, you can eventually diffuse these circles so they spread out across the whole field. So say, for example, you need to heal your whole party really quick. You can diffuse the circle, the magic circle, the healing circle, whatever, and your whole party will get some help. Uh, maybe the enemy is standing in one of these circles and it's a, a you know fire circle or whatever. You can diffuse it and he's going to get a huge hit of fire on him. Uh, if you're just standing in one of these circles, your weapon will take on the properties of, you know, that type of attack. So it will deal extra damage. Um, so it's a lot more like, it's like a lot more management. You have to be ready to do this thing on a dime or that thing on a dime. Uh, it also has lives, which is interesting. So you can be knocked out about five times each and uh, you can you, you heal after a little bit. You, you just come right back to life with a new health bar. And so basically I mentioned earlier a, a mechanic it's called gathering and what it does is like i said it draws all these enemies to you but it also lets you heal or revive a party member that's fainted and they also a a they also have five lives so say i don't know say lol he's unconscious uh i have to run over to him using gather and he'll come back to life and he can rejoin the fight um one thing I will say uh, against it is uh, it's technically a complete mess. Uh, I was playing it on my Wii U and the thing was chugging. Like it was making so much noise while I was playing this like Wii game. It's a, it, I felt like it was really bad. It was pretty bad. It was just, I was saying, air, air, 
er, er. It's just got loading noises. And it's like not like a visually beautiful game. Like it's a nice looking game, but it's kind of like middle of the road in terms of graphics. And it's not like a massive game either. It's basically you, you're in this hub world, Lazla City. And uh, one of the other issues I had with it is there are side quests peppered throughout, but you have to find them. It's not on the map. It doesn't show up on your map saying, oh, there's something over here. There's something over there. Uh, you have to go running around looking for people to give you quests. And there was a weird structure with the story where there is these optional uh, optional chapters that are literally just long side quests. You don't have to do them, um, but you're encouraged to do them because it gives you more character moments. Uh, you can level up more. And one of them has like a character's best weapon really early on in one of these side quests. You have, you have to do the side quest to get this weapon, and it's his best one. Like, from very early on in the game. And it get, informs you more of these characters. Like, you get one guy's backstory. You get kind of more of an impression of what Marani is about with nature. Uh, you meet some like, some other side quests on the city are, are with this other guy. You get to meet this, like, the supporting cast member as he takes you along on... These really bizarre quests. There's one where you go, you have to go into like a haunted house and find a ghost. And there'll be like points where like your party members will be grabbed and put in these open graves. And you have to go grab them and they'll be dragged over again to these graves. You have to pop them out again. It was so goofy and silly. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like among my favorites just because of how, how I took to the characters. They're so great. I love that they used actual, like, British uh, actors, and they all have kind of, like, you get, like, an idea of this is a big world because they all have different accents. So it just sounds like all these characters from, are coming from around the world, even though they're just, you're kind of stuck in this one area, and you do occasionally go to, like, you go out to sea for a little bit, and you come back. Uh, I, just, I just found the characters in the world overall to be, like, very charming and appealing. Uh, I, I am... I'm hoping, I am hoping that maybe someday we'll be blessed with a Switch port. Not necessarily because I think, oh, it's, I love this game, I hope it gets a Switch port, but because it would be really, it would, it would be serviced well by getting released again, because um, it would give them a chance to make some tweaks. Like I, like I said, the whole side quest thing was kind of annoying. I didn't do any, like, non-optional uh, story side quests because they're kind of a pain to find, uh, but they're kind of important because they give you like material for weapons. Um, I wasn't, again, the graphics weren't anything to write home about, and it was incredibly annoying how loudly my Wii U was chugging along. And the game doesn't really require motion controls. It's not really a motion control game. There is like one part where you, you can uh, fire a crossbow, but I don't remember it having motion controls to it. So it, it was kind of weird because the developer Mistwalker is kind of more known for their Xbox 360 exclusive games. Like we might know them for like Blue Dragon or Lost Odyssey. They were kind of like around when uh, Microsoft was trying to push, you know, the Xbox 360 towards the Japanese market with all these RPGs. And they made all these uh, DS games. And then, of course, they made Last Story. But then all of a sudden they fall in this weird mobile game hell where they're just making constant Terra Battle games that no one plays. And it's just kind of sad and embarrassing, because this is a great studio with lots of talent behind it. And what I found interesting, I didn't even know this until recently, but they're, they're not like a development studio the same way, you know, um, uh, Bioware is, where they make a game and someone publishes it. They, they're more of an ideas house. They come up with the characters, story, world... They do the music, they, they have the art, and they farm out the gameplay to someone else with, I believe, a developer or a, a director at um, Mistwalker, you know, directing it, making sure everything gels what they want to do. Like, if you look at any of their games, you'll see that they didn't make any of them except for the, their mobile games solely by themselves. They had, like, art tune or some other developer working on it. It was the same with this one. I think it was, what are they called? A-C-Q-L Interactive? A-Q-L Interactive? One of those kind of, some, some, some acronym like that. Um, so I'm hoping that someday we'll get a port of this amazing game. Uh, if you have a Wii, if you have a Wii U, go out and find it. You can find it for like 30 bucks on eBay. It's a great game. Pretty short. It's like 12 hours. It's actually really short, but it doesn't feel short. Like I felt like I played it for weeks and weeks and weeks and i didn't feel it felt like i was playing a 40 hour game 
but it was 12 hours to 13 hours, basically. I got so mm. much at, I got so much out of it because there was just so much going on. You have like you have all these you have this huge cast. By the end of the game, you're in level you're in the 40s or 50s in terms of levels. They break it up by chapters, and there's so many chapters. And there's a bunch of bosses, there's a bunch of different locations you go to, so it's stuffed like it's a much bigger and longer game than it actually is. There's so many, like, story twists and turns. You have, like, all these, like, side characters who you have you come in with these preconceived, no- you know, pr- notions towards, but they end up being, like, really great. Like, there's, like, this guy who, there's, like, this knight at the castle who's kind of a dick, and I was thinking the whole time he was going to turn on you and be a villain or a boss or something, but it turns out he's just a really cool bro. He is like the ne- <laughs> he is like the most awesome. He's like the most awesome, loyal person ever who will just do anything for you. I was like, whoa! I didn't see this coming. I love this guy. All these little things here and there. It it, it was just such a very full game. Like I didn't expect it to be so short, but it didn't feel that short. If you get what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, had a, it had enough to do. It didn't outstay its welcome. Yeah. I- I can't believe, uh, well, so there were actually post-game, there was post-game content, and it was on it, it was actually really good post-game content, it wasn't just go to this dungeon, fight this boss, it was all, like, at least one of them, I remember, was literally just an epilogue, pretty much. It, like, it tied up all the story ends, gave you an ending that you can be satisfied with, and uh, even though it was a really annoying boss... Uh, that you fight in this dungeon because you only go in with two characters and uh, this boss can eat one of your those characters so it's literally just you fighting by yourself but uh, yeah it was a great game favorite game of the year by far one of my favorite JRPGs go look for it uh, I hope that Fantasian is a great game M- Mist Walker please let it be good <laughs> <laughs> alright sounds like a fun one yeah. Hendy your first best gaming experience this year is something i think we've heard someone else say good stuff about oh yeah and no surprise there my last game is yakuza like a dragon Uh. ah i say i say quest at the end because this is basically dragon quest 12 if they had decided to put the series in a modern setting with japanese gangsters I saw that someone else, (laughs) as you mentioned, I saw that someone else had this in their top three in the last episode, and for good reason. I think any Dragon Quest fan, especially those that enjoyed enjoyed Eleven, would love this game. It came out recently, and you can get this for the Xbox, PlayStation, or Steam. Um, All the other Yakuza games have been brawlers, but this is a straight-up turn-based RPG. There are direct and indirect Dragon Quest references all over this game. The main protagonist directly mentions the series all the time. He actually wants to emulate being a hero from the games. When they get into fights, in his mind, it's a Dragon Quest style battle, so the enemies will often transform, and that's how the game kind of explains why the series is now turn-based with this new game. I recently saw an interesting conversation in the Dragon Questers Facebook group about a guy that was worried about playing as a Yakuza gangster. He kind of compared the game to um, other games like Grand Theft Auto and games similar to that. But we let them know that it's not like that at all. You aren't killing random civilians, you aren't stealing cars. You do start out as a Yakuza gangster, but quickly break away from them. Your character is just a hero trying to save the day. And a lot of the side quests that you do follow this theme as well. It's really a a love letter to Dragon Quest. The guy who created the game is a big fan. Uh, Some of the different mechanics that you see that are very reminiscent of Dragon Quest there's ATM machines where you can store your store your money, kind of like the bank system in Dragon Quest. Uh, when you die, you lose half your money. There are they have their own version of mini medals, and there are honk honk girls, <laughs> honk honk, <laughs> which are a nod to Puff Puff girls. Uh, there's even a dude that wants to become a bunny girl, which is a long running character in all the Dragon Quest games that have a Dharma temple in it for class changing, which this game also has as well. There's different classes you can change into. Uh, they also have a, in a <clears throat> they also have a hilarious homage to Pokemon in a Mario Kart style mini game as well. It's great. Uh, I'm a bad reviewer because I haven't finished this game yet, but so far all of it takes place in this big open city in Japan. 
At first, you have to be careful that you don't wander too far or the advanced bad guys in those areas will kill you very easily. It's like going one bridge too far in the older Dragon Quest games. Same kind of Oh man, you beat me to the punch. I was nah. going to ask if you just don't cross a bridge, are you okay? <laughs> no, it's 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 uh, not quite as obvious, but like it's the the city's built into different neighborhoods, so like you just have to avoid certain neighborhoods, especially in the beginning, or else you'll get your butt kicked. But uh, I know from life. chatting, I know from ha, <laughs> yeah, I know from chatting from a friend that uh, Yakuza games are famous for all the different mini games that you can play. Uh, this one is no different. There are mini games like Western style gambling, like um, poker and, and things like that. Eastern style gambling, batting cages, a golf dome, darts, crane machine games, and they even have actual classic Sega arcade games such as early Tekken games, virtual fighter games, and Outrun. So it's like they actually have like little mini Sega games in the arcade that you can go to, and it's just like straight out of uh, playing it on a, a an older system or something like that, or, or older arcade game. I've learned that from this game that I am absolutely awful at Eastern style games of chance and skill. <laughs> <laughs> like Mahjong or, or, or their version. I was going to say, beat me their, every time. Yeah, or, or, or that, uh, I forget what the, that, ver they have like a, a variant of chess. Uh, Shogi. I, I tried Shogi and I was like, I'm good at chess. But Shogi, yeah, I need to, I need some practice because I was just, I was awful <laughs> at that. Uh, it will be interesting yeah. to see how much of a, a role they play in the PlayStation trophies because if uh, those Eastern style gambling and and games of skill are part of how you get some of those PlayStation trophies, like I am not getting a platinum, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the plot and the characters are fantastic so far. The plot involves a steady but uneasy peace between Japanese, Chinese, and Korean gangsters that all falls apart from an outside influence, which I won't get into because I don't want to, you know, do any spoilers here. I'm currently in chapter 10 of 15 chapters, and I hear there's a post game too. As far as I've ex as far as I've experienced so far, and have been told, you really don't need to have played any of the past games before you play this. You can just go into this blind, and it doesn't matter. It's a fantastic game, and I highly recommend it. And before I go into my honorable mention, has uh, anyone else in here? played it yet or tried it i have not played not. it but I, i've always kind of admired the yakuza games from afar mm -hmm. and i was hearing about this one in particular how it's basically all you know references to dragon quest i was like oh boy i i, I was always gonna i've always been saying every year this is the year why i binge through every game because i have like i have almost every single yakuza game on my shelf i just have oh, like really? yeah i have Zero, Kiwami, Kiwami 2, uh, I have 6, I think I'm only missing 4 and 5. Do you have a Xbox or at all? I do actually have an Xbox, but they're known, they're act it's actually a, mostly, a, it's always been a PlayStation uh, series. It's only mm -hmm. just recently made the move mm -hmm. to uh, Xbox. Like, uh, yeah, from Xbox what I hear, like, most all of them are on Game Pass now. Yeah, they, uh, Xbox didn't really have any, ex any big games to launch with, so they made... Uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon, their big launch game. Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. so crazy, considering I remember, like, back when, around between 4 and 5, everyone thought it was never going to come to the West again, because they had done this big, lavish production doing the first Yakuza game. They got all these famous Hollywood actors. They had Mark Hamill in there. Um, oh, wow. They had they had one of the... he They had one guy from... Uh, What's his name? Um, uh, from Kill Bill, who was one of the one of the assassins in Kill Bill, Michael Madsen. I think Michael Madsen was in there. Oh, gotcha. Um, they had all these big Hollywood actors, and it kind of fell flat. And then the second one, I don't believe ever got a dub. It was just a straightforward release. The third game came, fourth game came, and then the fifth game never came. And then at some point, randomly, they're like, oh, we're going to put out the fifth game on PlayStation 3 digital only. And then I think it was Yakuza 0 that made that game take off because they had like really ridiculous uh, side quests. Like, I've I've never played it. Uh, I've only played a little bit of Yakuza 1 Kiwami. Um, but I know all about the, uh, the uh, masochist, not masochist, the uh, exhibitionist dominatrix. The dominating oh. side quests. Yeah, they have that in this one too. Oh, of course they, of course they do. <laughs> uh, so I know all about that <laughs> specific side quest, and I think the how ridiculous the side quests were made the game meme memeable. Like people go, "Oh, look at this ridiculous side quest," and then 
people saw the game, and I think it got a lot of groundswell over time after Zero came out, and then they started pumping out all these Yakuza remakes all of a sudden, and then I think they said um, after the Kiwami one. Uh, two, three, and four, and f- uh, five all got re-releases on PlayStation Four, specifically for the Western audience to reintroduce them to the series. And now we're in a place where uh, Microsoft is desperately trying to get them all onto their console and making the new game its big launch exclusive. You'll notice that you can't play it yet. I don't believe, at least, on PlayStation Five. Only PlayStation Four. Oh, you can. You can. Um, well, say again. I believe it. it that's correct. The, the PS5 version exclusive. is not out. Oh, okay, because I know it is coming out, but I, uh, it's not yet. Okay, that's, I forgot. That's right. Correct. It's it's on literally everything but five right now as like a next gen console exclusive for Microsoft. It's really weird. Hmm. But yeah, they do have some wacky side quests, and there's, uh, I guess, one of the Final Fantasy influences. I guess would be there's this function that you have where. Uh, you can summon these characters to do a special attack for you, or they can uh, give you more magic points or heal you, recover you, or whatever. And some of the characters that you get to, that become summons are just absolutely ridiculous. Like the the, uh, the exhibitionist dominatrix team that you were talking about, he's one of them. Or there's you run into this really weird scenario where all these like yakuza gangsters like have this hobby where they go to this place. And they wear wear diapers, and they pretend to be babies, and they have this like w- woman take care of them the whole time, and that's one of the summons that you have is this this big yakuza gangster in a diaper that's crying and, and doing stuff, a sumo wrestler, all sorts of weird stuff. But it's absolutely hilarious. It's a lot of fun. I was watching yeah, a review, and, and I was look I was looking at the enemy names, and they I think that might be those might be homages to the enemy names in Dragon Quest because they're kind of. Oh, um, they yeah. are big. Yeah, guys. like yep. hungry, hungry, homeless, <laughs> or stuff like that. It's capital Punisher. Yeah. 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 Didn't the translator say too that like took inspiration from Dragon Quest monster names too? Like that's how they, they came up did. with like, the pun names. And what was all um, through RP Gamer? I was able to ask a question to the uh, development team. And that was the question I asked. Um, like, what other, you know, other than the very obvious stuff, did you guys put humor in the game and do puns or whatever? And I think, as Pendy was saying, like, the side quests have always been kind of off the wall yeah. in uh, those games. But uh, that, you know, yeah, they did try to do little homages to other Dragon Quest kind of stuff. And, yeah, those monster names might definitely be part of that. And it, and it may not have a Hollywood cast for the dub that they did for this game, but it does have a very solid voice acting cast that are a lot of people that you may recognize from other famous anime that are out there right now. They're like Richard Epcar does a bunch of voices. There's people from Attack on Titan that I recognize. So yeah, it's I saw a, Jeremy it's, Lee and Kaiji Tang. Right yeah, there. yeah. Mm-hmm. so it's got a, it's got a good dub. But you can you can do the uh, I think you can do the original Japanese as well. So you don't have to do that if you don't want to. It's mm-hmm. good to have both. It's always good to have both. All right. Well, uh, we'll oh, so, move on. To... Oh, you so, still got more? Go ahead. Just, just my last little bit. Uh, my honorable mention for me for 2020 would be Dragon Quest XI S 2D mode specifically. Whether you play it on Switch or PlayStation or whatever, floats your boat. But super fun to play. Uh, I love how it's old school graphics, kind of like Super Nintendo style. Random enemies instead of enemies on the field. And then the Tockles side missions that you get to do, which you can do in 2D or 3D mode. Uh, are terrific, where you get to go through all the different mainline Dragon Quest games, and all has side quests and missions related to those games. It's ter- it's a lot of fun. I, that's that's why that's my honorable mention because I finally did my second playthrough where I went to the 2D mode this past year. But that that's all I have for 2020. All right, excellent. Now, uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon, Yangus and I, we've both got this game in the past two weeks. Um, he was messaging me one day that he was going to get it, or he was looking at it at Best Buy, and the Steel Book was there. And I was like, ah, Steel Book, Schmeal Book, whatever. <laughs> um, so, and because I just ordered for like $35. Here it is. It's been out barely a month. It's already $35 on Amazon. So I ordered that copy, and what comes later the day in the day is actually the Steel Book version. I was like, oh, cool, because I'd heard on another podcast that you can get uh, some different costumes from the Sealbook version, like actually dress uh, Ichi, is it Ichiban, or what's his name? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Ichiban. Yeah, you can dress Mega. him up like like an actual hero. He can have a, an, a suit of armor thing. I was like, oh, that'd be cool. But oh, yeah, I didn't that. order for that version. 
But I, just... I got the steel book and the day one version, so whatever. I guess I'll have that when I go to play it. <laughs> and then Yangus, you got it for Christmas, right? Yeah, like I had just mentioned it in passing at one point at a family uh, get together when some of my cousins were there. Like, oh yeah, this is a game that I kind of know about that's coming out. And, you know, they're, they aren't really RPG players, but they at least know some of the stuff that I like. And I guess word got through the grapevine then, and then lo and behold, Christmas morning at my mom's place, it's like, hey, here's Yakuza Like a Dragon for you. It's like, awesome. okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It was the steel book so, yeah. too, so it's like, hey, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yep. I joked with him that uh, we're, we're going to try to do our RPG race this year. RPG race this year is going to be Bravely Default too. That's, that's uh, a game we've both we both will finish that i'm sure um but uh i i joked i said we should do yakuza like a dragon too <laughs> that may be too much pressure because that, that's a big game 60 70 hours from what i hear it is yeah. especially if you do all those side quests for sure you know we totally could have started that like late this year as our 2020 race but i'm having tv trouble so I'm, like with my switch i'm pretty much having to stick to um like handheld mode only so mm-hmm I, have, I just haven't had the time to go up and get a TV, so, or, you know, get a new TV. But so with my PS4, it's unfortunately just kind of sitting there not being used. So, <laughs> but I am looking forward to trying out uh, Like a Dragon, uh, mm-hmm. both from like what we heard from uh, Brewery and in the last episode, and then what Penny was telling us about tonight, too. So, I mean, it's not a series that I've ever played a game from, but admittedly, yeah. like them having like references to Dragon Quest does sound pretty fun. And like, it's been a series, like, kind of like, you know, like I've looked at it, but it's been one that I've wanted to try. I just, I just haven't in like the past two years because I've been so much into my Switch. But I'm hoping that uh, mm-hmm. Yakuza Like a Dragon will be a good um, entry point into the series and kind of getting used to some of the stuff that it has, other than, you know, the combat being different. But you know, hopefully mm-hmm. it'll get me interested in playing more of the games. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, it was Ooh. pretty wild I... me going into the den and like, oh yeah, everyone's saying they have Yakuza <laughs> Like a Dragon. I'm like, literally no one's ever talked about these games, and then all of a sudden <laughs> half the den's got them. <laughs> yeah, this you know, game definitely seems to make be a whole game like, that's a Dragon Quest so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why. Dragon Quest, that's probably why. Mm-hmm. That, no, that's okay. definitely why it got me interested. <laughs> it couldn't be Dragon Quest. That's crazy. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, talk about a quest that is dragging on. Dragon. Um, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> wah, wah. Nice segue. Uh, <laughs> nice segue because this this series does drag on, but I am learning that it's it's actually quite worth it. Um, I was gonna not gonna get too much as. Pendy did uh, talking about his two different games for his number two, but my number one game of the year, um, it's something I've actually been playing a little bit even tonight. Um, the Legend of Hero series, both uh, Yangus and I, that, that was our first race. Our first race was Trails in the Sky one, and I want to say that was 2017 that we tried. Yeah, that, that. was um, yeah, that was about um, like fall 2017, I believe, either September or yep. October. And I enjoyed it. I screenshot the hell out of it and made it all the way through. Um, Yangus fell off, got a DNF, although he did come back to it and finish it up uh, a year later or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did Cold Steel 1 the next year, and you've done that. But then I haven't really touched the series for a couple of years. Um, I've always been very interested in it. I got Cold Steel 3. Um, I, I have Cold Steel 2 I ordered for the Vita a couple of years ago. I got Cold Steel 3 sitting unopened for my Switch. But um, kind of on RP Gamer, I saw somebody make their goal this year to catch up. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I'll catch up, but I definitely want to do more. And in the spring, um, Tokyo Mirage Fest and I was playing that and um, Trails in the Sky 2 on my modded Vita at the same time and really enjoyed Trails of Cold Steel 2 or Trails in the Sky 2. That was awesome. It was a good finish and I was going to try something else. And then when I saw who the protagonist of Trails in the Sky 3 was, I was immediately like, yes, he was one of my favorite side characters from Sky 2. Let me jump right into it. And now that game ended up taking me about six months to beat. I kind of just kept playing it off and on. Um, it's more of a wrap-up for the first uh, Sky games. Um, I wouldn't say it's a side entry, but the nature of it is you're just going through these, um, and they're not random, but you're just going through these kind of bland dungeons, but then also going through these doors. God, there's like 15 different story doors, and there's like four different um, little game doors, and just battle doors. There's another some other ones of those and um i finally finished that up before recording an rpg backtrack episode about that last month 
And finishing it up before that, I was like, man, I should uh, keep going with the series. And I started the first Crossbell game. And this one is just um, blowing me away. It's a game that didn't come out in English. I'm playing a fan translated PSP version of it. Um, there's a PC version that has received a an amazing translation, but I don't like to spend a lot of time on my PC. Um, it's called Zero No Kaseki, and the PC version has had this dedicated fan group that has made a beautiful translation, try, kind of almost as good or as good as everybody can say, as all the Nisa and the XC translations that have been out. Um, they kind of standardize all the naming conventions, everything. And there's now a way to buy the PC version of this game using U.S. currency through a um, Chinese store and then applying the patch to do it and play it on PC. And everybody says that's amazing. I'm playing the PSP version. It's good. The uh, translation is a little rough in some areas, but it's good enough to play. There's a couple bugs, I will say, that's killing me. I can't... um, I can't cook, and cooking can make you some of the greatest healing items in the game, and I can't do that. And I couldn't go to the casino. Casino games froze, and actually my game just froze. I think I lost half an hour of progress just about 20 minutes ago, um, somewhere in the final dungeon, although that seemed to be a Vita problem, not a PSP problem. Um, But the Vita started right back up, so maybe we're good with that because i put like 53 hours into this game and it's great I, I i don't know why it's hitting me on so many more levels than the sky games maybe because i've put like a hundred and geez i may be approaching 200 hours in the series at this point um there's the sky trilogy of games there's this uh duology of crossbell games and then there's four of the Cold Steel games, and already there is another game out in Japan that apparently we'll be getting, and then just this week, they, or in the past couple weeks, they announced a second new game coming out in Japan. So this series just keeps on chugging along. Um, I love the combat. The combat is very Grandia-esque. Um, it's turn-based battles on a grid and lots of area of effects. Um, you see your who's going in what order, so you know exactly who's going to be attacking when, and if you do this attack, well, then it's going to bump you this far down in the turn order, um, kind of like Final Fantasy X that had the little pictures there. Um, I just love the combat, I, and I, this is one series that has really got me into using magic because I think it's really overpowered in the game. Um, I've got like my magic users here casting area of effect spells that are hitting for like 15, 1800 damage. And then like my best physical guys go up and hit for like four or 500 here at end game. And I noticed that in cross in the sky series that it was getting really good. If I played with the stuff in the settings and used good equipment, everything, I could just get the magic to churn out. And then all the little equipment that you can equip in here, the uh, magic items, the orbments, they call them. You can set them up to have someone do more um, fire spells or more water spells or air spells. And if you play around with them, they can get different benefits. And there's different little gems that you can put in. Um, like for both my magic users, I have one that costs th- that takes their time to cast a spell down by half. And another one does it by a quarter. But both of them have ones on them or equipment on them that uh, lets them regenerate magic points as you're walking around. So these two are just like casting spells left and right. And And I've got other gem. Yeah. And and like, uh, if if I remember right, like in Dragon Quest games, I think you're more of a physical attacker, aren't you? I am. I, in all my games are always like, well, you know, there's healing and gosh, if there's some guy who I can't really hit very hard, I have to use magic. I will, but these games have turned me completely around. I didn't do it in the first one so much, but yeah, in Sky 2 and Sky 3, I totally turned that around. Like, I'd go out of my way to do side quests to get equipment that'll boost up my arts. Uh, Magic is called arts in this game, and I just love it. it. It's awesome. And the stories, like, you hear about, uh, you know, if you play all the games in order, you get more out of it but you can kind of jump in wherever you want. Holy crap, in this Zero no Kaseki game, which in the big long ser- list of games, it's the fourth one overall, I've had at least three or four moments 
where I've got like a chill down my back. I'm like, holy shit, that name, that gosh, I remember that. And like, it, it's like hit emotionally because there's some definite themes in here that are like horrible. There, there's like little kids that were sold into slavery, like a whole sex slavery thing. And that reoccurs through the series. Um, like, I don't know what the end result of that is because you've got these horrible people with demons and whatever doing all these things. Um, and, and it's almost like a side part of it that like, it just mentions that. And like, they were even talking about this one politician in here and they're like, if it, you're in his room and you look up and like this name pops up in a book and they're like what does that name mean and i'm like holy crap that was like like that's something that brought tears to my eyes almost in the last game but if you hadn't played that last game it would just be like nah, he did bad things whatever but like just playing the game before you know the bad things you know how bad this is um and, and yeah i mean there's a lot of the jrpg tropes of oh you got to save the world whatever but Mo mainly this is more local which is something i've always like kind of joked about like gosh why can't there just be a jrpg where you save the city why does it always have to be damn it god's coming down to destroy the entire world you have to destroy god or something like that <laughs> damn it god's coming attack <laughs> and the dethrone god yeah like can't you just there's a bad guy who's doing a couple bad things and you stop him that's the end um and at least at the beginning of this year in Okaseki, you're just a police officer in the city and you're just solving a lot of stuff. And the mafia has got some issues going on and there's corrupt politicians and it's it's just very like a local game. And it's weird because I've seen good and bad about this. The game is literally in a city. Yeah, there's like 12 different districts that you're going through. And every now and then you're going out the East Gate and the West Gate and the South Gate and the North Gate and going to one other tiny little town to do stuff. But like the main game is mainly taking place in just one city. Um, and I know something bad is going to happen to the city in the second game because of what's happened in cold steel. So I'm can't wait to get to that part when I get to the next game. But um, it, it, just the storytelling is really amazing that they've set this up for like, I have nine games now going on 11 and it's it just little parts of different things affect other games. Um, you know, the main story of this game ha is not the main story of what sky was, um, but it's picking up on some of the side stuff and it's becoming bigger in this game. And it's interesting. I can't wait to do the next one and then see. Then it's time to go through Cold Steel 2, 3, and 4 and see how this relates to all that. So uh, it, I'm much more of a person that plays games for the gameplay than the story. Um, but this game is hitting. And, and I think this is probably one of the first, the, the first one that's really hitting me on both of those. Like I, I've literally got chills when I play some parts and realize what the hell story wise it's connecting to other games. Like, holy shit, I can't believe that just went there or that connected. So great fun. And one of these I'll days I need that. to try out this. Uh, I was just gonna say one of these days I, need, I really need to try out this series because you know you and I are both uh, admins at the turn-based RPG group, and everyone goes mm -hmm. wild over, the, over these games, and they do look interesting. I just haven't had a chance to try them out yet. Oh, and the, the big thing is, they are super text-heavy. Um, Yangus, you remember when they, was it Cold Steel 3? When it was coming out, um, was it Nista or Exceed, whoever was doing the translation, they were trying to say how much text was in the game. Yeah, Nista nice like, was advertising that, yeah. it was. Um, it's like a million words, something like three times as long as War and Peace or something like that. Yeah, it was, oh god, I don't remember the exact <laughs> number, but it was it was pretty crazy high. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to say and it mean, was all over the, a million, and they were really yeah. you know, pushing that. As well as and like I don't know if that's people who series wide or one game. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, oh, I was going to say I don't know if that was series wide up to that point or just that one game. But yeah, they are. It, this is something like every time a story beat ends, you can go talk to fifty different NPCs and they'll all have different dialogue oh, than they did ten minutes that, ago. That's yeah. that's similar to uh, Dragon Warrior Seven. That they mm -hmm. had a lot of that, where you could uh, mm -hmm. a simple event would change a lot of dialogue for a lot of NPCs like all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's and definitely reminiscent of that, for sure. So, yep, Legend of Heroes, uh, I I've been lucky. I've been able to play, I'm going to be able to play the first six games all on my Vita. Since I was able to get my Vita modded, I was able to play Trails in the Sky 3 on it, uh, which didn't come out over here. I bought it, actually, at a summer Steam sale, like, three years ago, and then was like, ugh, am I really going to sit on my computer and play this for 40, 50 hours? Luckily, with the modded Vita, I was able to get an English translation of the... Uh, 
Japanese Vita title and then the PSPs I've had here um, for this. And then I'll move to the Switch once it gets to Cold Steel 3 and 4. I've already got that pre-ordered. So uh, by the length of the games, I don't think I'll actually catch up next year. <laughs> but, you know, another three. If I, I got three games done this year or I'm at like 2.95 games. I hope to finish this in the next uh, 24 hours or so, but we'll see. Yeah, it's definitely pretty good that you've gotten through as many of those games this year as you have, because they are they can be long. They, yeah. They're fun, but I, they can be long games. <laughs> yeah, I, like I said, I've been thinking about 52 hours into this, and I probably got three or four hours more, so it's uh, going to be close to 60. Yeah. yeah, like, what was it? When you played Cold uh, when you played Cold Steel 1, how long did it take you to beat that? Do you remember? Not as long as you. I mean, okay. I probably did. <laughs> I, I, I might have done it like, 50 or 60 hours. That's what I was going to say. Like, depending on, like, what all you do, too, you can get a lot of time out of these games. But, you know, I think it's it's kind of like what you talking about, how this one particularly hit story beats with you with um, Crossbell 1 here. Like, I know mm-hmm. that that's sort of my experience I had when, when um, I went back to try uh, Cold Steel 1 again. Like, it just really clicked with me and i really was finding myself really engaged with what was going on so maybe with um like just hearing you talking about the series play maybe cross bell one or zero no Ketsky, whatever it's called uh, maybe mm-hmm. this is um that that equivalent for you like you just had to find the right one that just sort of like really clicked with you and you found everything just really worked for you uh, personally mm-hmm. yeah i mean and there's Gosh, like I said, there's three different sub-series right now, and they're adding a fourth. They're starting a fourth. They had a wrap-up one that kind of ends these whole nine games, so they, they've had a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they got the new one they just announced um, like two, three weeks ago, something like yep. that. Mm-hmm. And that's going to start a whole Calvard, Calvard, which is a, another country in the series they've mentioned, but you haven't visited. Mm-hmm. So, well... Angus, we'll give it to you to end this up with your uh, number one fun game of the season, year, whatever. <laughs> Boy, I don't know if I can follow up what you just were all talking about. <laughs> I was pretty good with what you were talking about with uh, Zero Noketsuki. <laughs> but um, uh, for my number one game, and probably one that a lot of people like from the den or elsewhere that I uh, know for people who can play games and stuff haven't really messed with, uh, my number one game was Bug Fables, uh, The Everlasting Sapling. Uh, this was a game that was created by a small team from Panama, uh, Moonsprout Games, and it released originally on Steam in, like, very late 2019, but then it came out to consoles about five months later in the middle of May of 2020 this year. So it's kind of one of those games where it sort of could fall in between the line of it was a 2019-2020 release, kind of weird how it is, but anyway, uh, this was a game that I just sort of found out by chance uh, back in the uh, springtime. Um, I had been quarantined at home because work or my job had closed down for two months because of the COVID stuff really ramping up here in Iowa at that time, and I was stuck at home playing a lot of games, so I was trying to look for something new to play for RPG-wise, and one of them that I came across was, I kept seeing this game mentioned coming to the Switch called Bug Fables, and I looked into it, and I could see that it was inspired by uh, the Paper Mario games, uh, specifically the first two, uh, the original on the Nintendo 64, and its sequel, uh, Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door, on the GameCube. And so I looked at it, it seemed kind of interesting, and just seemed like it was going to kind of scratch that itch that people have been hoping to, you know, get at since we haven't had a Paper Mario game in the style of the first two in a very long time. And it came out middle of May. I ended up buying it full price. I'm like, oh, you know, I've seen enough. It looks interesting. And I've heard a lot of good word of mouth from the Steam version and people who got an early test of the PS4 release and the uh, Switch release that was coming. And I did not expect this game to not only be one of my favorite games of 2020, but to be one that I was going to sink like almost triple the time it actually takes to beat the game into <laughs> into it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so Bug Fables, uh, like I said, it is very Paper Mario inspired, like characters are like little 2D figures on this big 3D world. The combat is very action oriented where you will go into it and you'll have to like push either the A button at the right t- with the right timing or you'll have to hold the control stick for a certain direction and then let go when you hear the d- 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 ding when it dings it for you to finally let go. Uh, just kind of stuff like that. But this game... Uh, takes place in the land of Bulgaria, which to all the insect characters, uh, you know, is this huge sprawling kingdom. But to a human's perspective like ours, you realize that, hey, this is just the backyard of what looks like an abandoned house. Just fenced in, trees growing, the grass growing everywhere. Uh, But the game focuses on a trio of explorers. Uh, There is V the honeybee, uh, Kabu the 
beetle. I believe he's based on the Hercules beetle, if I remember correctly. And there is Leaf, the, I believe he is a peacock moth, if I remember the species correctly. Uh, the, the first two, V and Kabu, are new to the Explorers Guild that's in the land of Bulgaria. And the kingdom has this decree and sort of this... Um, guidelines of sorts for this guild that's in the kingdom to go out and explore, find any sort of artifacts and clues you can find to this ancient treasure known as the Everlasting Sapling. Because as you learn from the backstory of the game when you start it up, uh, the Ant Kingdom has been trying to find this Everlasting Sapling ever since the first queen, uh, Queen Elizant, was trying to locate the sapling in order to help her kingdom prosper. Uh, she wasn't able to complete it, so her daughter, Queen Elizant II, took over and is continuing the search. So Kabu and V both came to the Explorers Guild to try and, you know, get their foot in the door, try and make a name for themselves, and uh, essentially go and find the sapling and help the kingdom out. Uh, v is... V was just there for trying to get rewards and, you know, more recognition, and Kabu's just there to show his skills. The two of them team up uh, to try and prove themselves, and their cha their task is to go into this big dungeon to the west of the kingdom called Snake Mouth Den. Uh, in there, they end up finding Leaf, who's trapped in a spider's web uh, on the lower floors of this um, cave. The three of them find that they are able to work together pretty well. They end up recovering the artifact that's inside Snake Mouth Den from the spider that's guarding it. And from there, they become officially recognized members of the guild. And they're pretty much tasked to go and explore the rest of Bulgaria with different hints and different uh, objectives to go to the different corners of the kingdom. Uh, what I really enjoyed about this game was definitely the writing. I absolutely loved the writing in this game and how there was a lot of world building. Uh, like I said, this is a game that takes place, you know, from a bug's perspective. You know, to us, this is just a regular, uh, looks like an abandoned backyard. There's, a, there's um, you know, a small tree growing in there. There's a sandbox. There's a little puddle of water, probably from a hose being left on. You know, stuff like that, you know, to us, it'd be nothing. But from the perspective the game takes place at, since you're playing as insects, you see that they've converted a lot of, like, our um, items, like boxes and tin cans and all sorts of stuff like that, into their, like, little houses, into uh, their buildings, into uh, converting stuff like toothpicks into weapons and spears, things like that. And as you go through the game, you will get these special lore books that will actually give you more details about the different kingdoms like the one thing i was trying like one of the things that i could not figure out about the game since it you know these are insects was like how exactly do these different kingdoms work because there's the ant kingdom there's the bee kingdom there's the termite kingdom that you go to towards the end of the game like how exactly does this work are they these like trying to be like insects like sort of replicating human lives or what's the deal here the game actually does a very good job explaining all this i won't go too much into details but essentially some of one of the key items that you see going around the world that you use to save your progress and you know heal up and stuff that plays into why the insects are the way that they are and why the world's kind of the way that it is and you also get to learn about like how you know the kingdom hierarchy works and how, like, you know, the ant kingdom and the bee kingdom, for instance, you know, they're ruled by a queen. And even though, you know, all the subjects are technically their children, they don't necessarily view them as that. Or, like, the workers, bees, and the worker ants don't necessarily, like, view the queens as their mother. They, you know, they view them as their queen and will do, you know, whatever they're set, uh, assigned to do. Or, you know, in the case of the main characters, they'll go off and do exploring. Because that's a big thing, too, for these for the characters. And one of the reasons I really like the game is how the characters are developed. Uh, so the main trio of characters, like I said, are V, Kabu, and Leaf. All of them have their own reasons for wanting to, you know, explore, become these members of the guild, and go around Bulgaria. Like, and I was really impressed with how this game handles the character development. So once you get your party uh, going, you can use the... Uh, on the Switch version, you can use the minus button to use uh, basically your party chat, and characters will like respond to the area you're in, or to a character you're standing next to, or in battles too, they each have their own uh, different takes on enemies that you can come across. And what's nice is that with the enemies case, you can look into the enemy uh, bestiary book and see like everybody's comments without having to like go through every single one in battle. Uh, but what I really liked was how these characters evolved. Because when they first start out, you know, V and Kabu are just working together because they have to work together because they both happen to be at the guild at the exact same time. And when they uh, rescue Leaf from the uh, Snake Mouth Den, he 
tags along with him, but is pretty sarcastic and doesn't really care about what's going on. He's just more so along for the ride just because they helped him. But as the game goes on, you really get to see this nice development of kinship between them and them sort of opening up a bit more and changing as characters. Like, V was a character when I started playing, I really did not like her very much because she's she reminded me a lot of like a Maribel sort of character almost where she was just, you know, complaining about everything. She only wanted to have like the best reward or she was more so concerned about what she was going to get out of all of this exploration and everything. And like, what's the reward she was going to get for helping people. But as the game goes on and like when you go, especially when you go back to the bee kingdom, she starts to open up more about, you know, why she's so focused on that. And you see that she's having troubles with her, basically her adopted sister how she's always felt sort of out of place. And as the game goes on, even though she still kind of has those tendencies where she's like, oh, you know, I hope we get a really cool reward. She's not as greedy as she is like when you first start the game, like when you get to chapter five or six. She becomes a lot more concerned with others and, you know, trying to use possibly any rewards that she gets to maybe help somebody else if they need it. And like one of the side characters you can talk to is this um, moth girl who you'll meet in different towns in different locations who can actually play you music from different parts of the game. If you talk to her every time in a village, V will actually be like more and more encouraging to her, you know, just to, you know, keep doing what you're doing, keep traveling around, learn all of these new songs, uh, you know, share your experiences with people. And even like Kabu and Leaf will actually comment on, wow, she's really, you know, grown up since we first met her. She's really, you know, coming to her own. And I really enjoyed that there was that, um, like, uh, it was a very good sense of progression for the writing and for how these characters were changing. And, you know, they, they, at, by the end of the game, they really felt like a very close team of characters who not only were working together, you know, for the sake of this ant kingdom that's looking for the everlasting sapling, but they felt like they'd become like their own kind of little family since they all were sort of misfits and came together. But it didn't feel like it was just like, oh, you know, we're friends for the power of friendship or whatever. It felt like there was a genuine uh, growth between these characters. And I really, really liked that. And like I said, I really enjoyed the writing for the land itself. Like, there's a lot of details in this game that if you... You, if you don't want to look through it and read it, you know, you're, you're still going to have a great time. But if you take the time to, you know, go look for these lore books and, you know, take them back to the library and read through and everything. There's a lot of interesting stuff in this game that it doesn't always get touched upon by the end of the game or touched on as you play through the game itself. But it's cool to see these details and then you start to notice like, oh, OK, that's why this area is like this or, oh, that's why the final dungeon, you know, is in the in condition that it is. Uh, but um I also really enjoyed the combat in this game. Like I said, it is very much like a Paper Mario game or a Mario RPG where you have to push the buttons in time with your different actions. Uh, but what's nice is that all of the characters each have their own respective abilities. So Kabu, for instance, he's really good at getting enemies who might have a defensive shell or perhaps can um, hide themselves away so they'll take zero damage. He can help flip them over since he is a beetle. You know, he has the horn, he flips them over. Uh, you have Leaf who... Thanks to his abilities, he's one of the few characters in the game that can use um, magic. So he's able to use his ice attacks to not only bring enemies out of hiding, but if there's an enemy who um, is on fire, for instance, or if someone who you know you can't normally hit because it might be intangible, he can actually use his ice to freeze them or knock them up out of the ground, which then lets the other two characters deal damage. And you have Vu as a boomerang and. She can, she's like, she can easily fly up and hit an enemy, or she can throw her boomerang to hit enemies in the back row. So there's a nice bit of strategy with your characters. And, like, one of my favorite things to do, whenever, especially against some of the harder bosses, was you can use Kabu to, you know, taunt enemies so they all will attack him. You can have Leaf throw up his uh, magic ice shield attack to protect Kabu from all damage. And then you can have V either just, you know, pump her up with uh, stat boosting metals or with... Um, special items, and she can just go to town damaging enemies while everybody's focused on trying to damage Kabu, who they can't hurt because of the shield. And that's one strategy you can do, and there's some other ones with, like, status ailments and, um, like, having certain badges or medals equipped that will allow characters to, you know, get an attack boost but might lower their defense, or if somebody in the party gets attacked in particular, it'll boost their strength then for the next turn. And that was another really cool thing about this game was uh, the medals. There Again, it's a, kind of the Paper Mario influence where that those games had badges you can equip for different abilities or increase certain stats and things like that. The medals work in the same way, but unlike that game, uh, the Paper Mario games, where they were more so for abilities or for boosting, just like just straight up boosting your attack or defense if you had enough badge points. With uh, Bug Fables, they're, they're more built around like, oh, well, 
your character can do this, but you might end up losing this ability. Or you'll get, um, if you equip this special uh, poison metal, you can have V use poison needles instead of regular ones, so she can do some extra damage over time to enemies, but at the cost of lowering her attack by one. So there's kind of a, you have to sort of weigh your options when going into it, and I really appreciated that. Again, it's kind of like why I enjoyed um, other RPGs like Etrian Odyssey or uh, Saga games, where you have to sort of weigh your options on what you should and shouldn't do, and I, I appreciate that. And it really feels like by the end of the game, as the characters keep growing, and you know, you do some of the side quests to gain some new abilities for everybody, that that there's a really nice, again, like the character growth, there's a nice sense of battle growth, too. And I really, really like that. I had a lot of fun with the battle system. And um, let me see. One other thing that I thought this game did really well is that there are a lot of secrets that you can uncover. Like, I I went into this game uh, very blind, other than just the early reviews and stuff that people were kind of giving their impressions. And I really just kind of stayed away from looking up any strategies or secrets or anything. And I was really surprised how much stuff like I was able to find just by exploring and, you know, kind of typically doing what I normally do when I play an RPG. Like, uh, without going too much into spoilers, um, I found out that there was actually a secret fourth party member that you could get, which was really cool and uh, unexpected um, addition to the game, particularly for what the character is. Um, there was a large optional dungeon that you can actually totally miss unless you, like, talk to a certain NPC and, you know, you get a certain item from one of the story dungeons, actually. But if you don't know where to use it at, then you might just think, oh, well, you know, this is just a key item that, you know, just kind of sits in your inventory. Uh, there's this fun card battling mini game that you can do where you can go across Bulgaria and look for these different card masters to uh, not only, like, you know, prove that you're worth and can fight in this big tournament on what they call Metal Island, which is actually just a... <laughs> it's actually just a... Um, Oh, a drain cover that is just like floating on this small little puddle. <laughs> but um, then you have like just the recent big November update that they added where there's some new secret side quests that you can get and some really powerful super bosses that you can challenge if you can uh, locate them. And um, really, that was one of the things that I enjoyed the most is that there was so much to this game, like so much more than I was expecting. And there was a lot of the side quests were really fun to do. You never felt like they were intrusive on your main goal because you could sort of naturally do them as you played through the game, which I really enjoyed. Unlike some RPGs where like, I'll just go back to Xenoblade Chronicles where you might have to do like kill X amount of enemies. And then you have to go immediately talk to that person or go collect me X amount of items and then bring them to me. This game did not feel like it did that. It would give you the quest, you would talk to the person, but then you would just, as you were playing, you might just naturally come across it, or if you go back to an area for another side quest, it's like, hey, look, there's you know that thing I need for this quest. I'll take that, and boom, there you go. And you're good to go for that quest. So there was a lot of stuff I thought this game handled really well. Um, aesthetically, you know, it is an indie game, so some of the 3D stuff in the, in the environments... It, it does look a little bit rougher around the edges than like what you might find from a big company. But really, I thought visually, like character designs were very nice. They were very simple, but they did a really good job emoting with them and you know using them to their full advantage. A lot of the enemy designs were fun. It was again interesting to see like what sort of enemies were classified, like or what um, bugs were classified as enemies and which ones were considered like you know just like more of the regular citizens you might come across and. Um, Villain-wise, like, one of my biggest complaints with this game, I would say, is that some bosses feel like they have a bit too much HP for the point of the game you're at. And, like, the, the boss of Chapter 3 in particular, I felt was a really big jump up in how much HP it had compared to what you might have at that point. But otherwise, like, boss designs were really fun. Some of the optional bosses you can come across were really cool, too. And the final, or, or not sorry, the main villain of the game that eventually comes into play about halfway through... You get sort of hints about this kingdom that could be, you know, sort of a big problem to you. Well, then he comes into play. And even though he doesn't have, like, the most development in the game, it's actually when you get to the post-game content that you really start to learn a lot about this character. And that was really cool to see that, because if there's one thing that this game definitely did really well, it was trying to make its characters, you know, very believable, very likable, and, you know, doing a good job helping them show them uh, either change as characters, like whether they were in your party at the present time or someone you uh, came across that you then learn about at a later point, which is, like again, the case with the final boss. Uh, but overall, this is definitely one of the best indie RPGs I've played and one of my favorite RPGs that I've played in a long time. 
Uh, like I said, the Paper Mario inspiration is is pretty clear with the 2D characters combat and some of the other stuff. But I really feel like this game does stand out on its own because you can really tell the devs, even though they were inspired by Paper Mario, they really strive to make something their own because... Even though, you know, I did notice the Paper Mario elements, like, really after, a f- like, a f- the first few hours of playing it, I, that really never crossed my mind again with that inspiration. They, you can tell that it's there, but it's not something where it feels like, oh, this is just a Paper Mario clone, or this is trying to be just a ripoff of those or anything like that. This is a game that I really feel like the devs, you know, really put their all into making this very believable, fun, exciting world to go through some really they made some really great characters a fun combat system and i really hope that uh the 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 positive feedback and the good sales from the console releases will be able to and especially with the big update that just hit november that they will be able to uh you know make a sequel to this game or perhaps maybe they'll be able to revisit it and add some more content to it because i really think like with some of the stuff again, that I haven't gone into for spoiler reasons that this game touched upon, I think a sequel could do a really good job sort of expanding more on this world and its characters and everything. Because I would love to see what the devs could do with a sequel game or what else they could do. I absolutely would recommend um, Bug Fables if you have, uh, you know, if you have a gaming PC, if you have a Switch, you got a PS4, I believe it's on Xbox as well. If you can find this game and get it on a sale, it's very much well worth it. I've gotten like 60 hours out of this game. I cannot wait to replay it and use some of the new features that you can use to sort of change up the game as you if you have, as you see fit. And I totally 100% recommend this game and absolutely loved every single minute of it. Is it made by uh, an indie developer or a yep. major? Oh, okay. okay. Yep, nice. this was made actually by just a group of three guys from Panama and then they were helped uh, they uh, a company called uh, Dangan Entertainment help them publish and you know get, put a little more production into the game so it right. definitely i think that this was a game that started out as more of a passion project but then it just kept kind of growing and i i think it has it turned out pretty well for them because there's a lot of if you go to their twitter feed which i'm not normally a twitter guy but if you go to moon sprouts and bug fables uh, twitter pages there's there's a lot of really cool fan art not only from like uh, western fans but from uh people in uh, asian territories from like all over the world, it's really cool to see all the different art that people have been sending in and you know sharing their experiences with the game. All right, well there you have it. We won't bug you any longer with all of our uh, 2020 memories. We can uh, move on to 2021 pretty soon. <laughs> but um, bump. So Yangus, you already mentioned your honorable mentions earlier, I believe. Yep, I yep uh, mentioned those. For, I decided just to do that first and foremost. So all right. Well, in that case, that's it for this episode of Slime Time SideQuest. We do want to always thank Aust, Pendy, and Evan for joining us to talk about their favorite games of 2020. Thank you. Not a problem. Yes, we did have, we had a few crossover games. Um, Excuse me. Let me try that again. (laughs) Thank you (laughs) for joining us, guys. Let me read my notes properly this time. (laughs) Thank you for joining us and uh, talking about your games with us. Uh, We had a few crossovers from our guests and their picks of the year, but it was great to hear everybody's takes on their favorite uh, 2020 gaming experiences, uh, especially like from uh, like like a, uh, from like Dragon Quest of the Stars and Like a Dragon with tonight's episode. It was interesting hearing uh, your takes on them, Pendy, uh, compared to like what Blue and uh, Barurian told us about in the last episode. So thank you guys for both sharing your uh, favorite games with us tonight. Yeah. It's always good to hear all these different points of view on it because we all like games for uh, similar reasons, but then also some of our own personal ones. And Uh, and I went into this and I went to this blind, so I I have no idea what their takes were on it. So I'll be interested to hear that as well to see kind of what similarities they had to what they mentioned to to what I did. Excellent. Uh, Something that we're always blind to here is uh, using Patreon for our podcast. Um, The only time we ever mentioned that. (laughs) Patreon is when we say we don't use it. We're just longtime fans that want to speak about the topics and the games we know and love so much. If you do have money that you would like to donate, consider sliding on over into the Dragon's Den at www.wudis.com slash den. Click on support the site. Wudis has owned and maintained the Dragon's Den fan site for over 20 years and would appreciate any donation. Um, You can also use his Amazon affiliate links to make any purchases of Dragon Quest stuff. He's got a ton of stuff up there. Um, so go on over there and support the dead. Uh, if you have any suggestions for a future side quest episode, we'd be happy to hear from you. You can reach out to Platy via his Twitter, uh, Platy M3, or on the Dragon's Den official unofficial Discord. 
Uh, you can also contact me at Yangus the Legendary Bandit on the Dragon's Den via personal message or uh, via the Dragon's Den Discord. Uh, just search for uh, my name, Yangus. Uh, we have a list that's full of ideas and would be happy to add some more if you have any suggestion for us. Or if you want us to revisit a topic at some point, we would be uh, happy to do that if we get enough feedback for it. Bye, everyone. Side quest and 2020 complete. See you all in 2021.